There are podcasts and there are podcasts. This is the latter. Welcome everybody to episode 0021 of A Review to a Kill, our Bondcast podcast series here about the James Bond franchise coming to you from fanboysanonymous.com. You asked for an introduction and that's all Fanboys Anonymous guarantees. <laughs> My name is Tony Mango, but you'll find my hosting credit under Beach. And I'm joined by Half Monk, Robert D. Felice. You know my name. Yes, it's Robert D. Felice. <laughs> Correct. And Half Hitman, Callum Wiggins. I'm sorry, Tony, I'm going to have to take the next podcast. There's not enough room here for me and your ego. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> So what we're doing here is we are talking about the 21st film. That's why it's episode 0021, Casino Royale, one of the absolute best Bond films, not to bury the lead, but, you know, it's one of the ones that we were looking forward to talking about the most. I'm sure it's one of the ones that a lot of people would agree with us on that. And we're going to break things down the way that we always do here. We're going to run down the 007 elements that make up the movie. We're going to be talking about the film itself from start to finish. And we remind you to let us know what you think about the film. Drop a comment below. Tell us your thoughts on what we were saying as well. Hit that like button if you want to show your support and pass this around YouTube and everything. Obviously, there's no hit button uh, or no hit button to like. No like button to hit elsewhere, like on Spotify and Amazon and stuff. But, you know, there might be a star rating thing or some kind of a follow thing or whatever. Any kind of thing that you do like that to support us is great. The applause button as well. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. Ring that little notification bell as well. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Check out everything we got going on on the member side of YouTube. The same thing as the Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash fanboysanonymous and help support us in whatever way that you can. Toss some spare change our way and take advantage of the pick a poison tier or something if you want us to check out the other Casino Royale, for instance. That's something that we don't really necessarily have planned, but if you want to make we sure that we do, I did. I would I would advise us not to. <laughs> yeah, it's not a not something that I'm too keen on, but that might even make it more fun. I don't know. Maybe we do like a fan tracks for it or something. Uh, that's the whole point of the pick your poison tier is you get to request that sort of thing. So keep that in mind if you are into this idea, and of course, any support is greatly greatly appreciated. So. Let's start things off the way that we normally do here. We talk about the title itself, and of course, we don't need to really explain why the title is the title, but let's talk about some alternate titles. Not a whole lot going on this time around, but there were two that I thought were kind of interesting. One of them is One to the World, the Telugu Indian dubbed version title, accordingly uh, to the IMDb. And Taiwan's version of it is 007 The Royal Nightclub, which just seems like a completely different type of movie. The working title, or more so the code name that the movie was delivered to when they were delivering it to movie theaters so people wouldn't steal the cut of it, was called Rough Skins. I like it. Obviously not for the movie itself, but, you know, it's like... Nobody's going to go, ah, okay, that's the Bond film. I'll take it, you know? Sounds like a really bad porn name. I was thinking like a football drama, you know? <laughs> the old pigskin type of thing. And our taglines are taglines. Going to have my uh, voice crack there. Always bet on Bond, which I love. Discover how James became Bond, which I hate. Yeah, that's stupid. Funny enough, the other tagline is a whisper of love, a whisper of hate. So maybe they were talking about the taglines. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Uh, I just want to get this out of the way because it's my one critique. Craig don't look like Bond and I felt that at the time, but I was also only 13 and not well versed in this series. It bothered me even more here because it's just such a different Bond. Visually. I agree. I will not harp on the point, but I still to this day do not think that Daniel Craig looks the part as much as I would hope. And uh, plenty of other people thought so too. When they announced his casting, it was a whole thing of like, it's James Blonde instead of James Bond. And not a big, big, you know, whoa, man, this is a perfect guy for the part kind of a thing. 
lots of other people supposedly in the mix for it, though. And the main competition was Henry Cavill, the one who plays Superman. He was 22 at the time, and they all just kind of agreed that he was just a little bit too young for it. Now he's at the perfect age, and it would be great, I think, if he could be Bond, but who knows what the hell's happening. Today, we're recording this uh, the 26th of May, which, by the way, uh, if the setup doesn't sound as great, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out some different audio things. I'm not in my normal setup and everything, so I apologize if you hear, like, sirens go off or the audio levels are a little bit off or there's some kind of a tinny echo or something. I'll try to do the best I can with editing this, but... On the 26th, when we were recording this, they officially confirmed that Amazon has bought out MGM, which means they now have the rights to the James Bond series. And we have no idea what that's going to create in the future. That could be some really good stuff with the James Bond series. It could be some disastrous effects. Before we get into the movie itself, what are you guys thinking about when it comes to that? More signs that the world is headed towards streaming, and specifically under the umbrella of Amazon. I wish they would have done this before we started this journey, so we we could all get the uh, movies on Amazon. You know, I'm sure they would have ended up in Prime Video and Free, so that would have been nice. But I, I think this is good. I think Amazon is a brand that I would trust with not only this franchise, but just the MGM library in general thumbs up i can't really say whether i think there's going to be a positive or negative in the fact that amazon is owning it, is owning it just because i don't think the mgm really did any harm to the bond franchise in general like it had good movies it had not so good movies but overall i don't think it really tarnished the name on its own so amazon for the most part i just hope amazon don't do anything with it beyond just keeping it and just I don't know, getting the money out of it. That's the only reason they would have bought it. Um, I'm expecting, if there's one thing I'm expecting to be different, I'm expecting some a development of a Bond extended universe. I don't want that to happen. I don't want like a spinoff TV show about Q or, uh, you know, some kind of young James Bond miniseries. Like yeah, I don't want anything like that. Just keep giving me Bond. You know what, though? Animated shorts about Q would be funny. Just like, him joking about his work? <laughs> yeah, just him, like, making wacky gadgets. Just, like, little shorts, and you release them in bulk. I think that'd be fun. Well, I'm also not anticipating any of the people who were almost James Bond for Casino Royale to end up being the next James Bond, because most of them are way past the age range at this point being, uh, for instance, Hugh Jackman. He was in the running for this. He was very seriously in the running, according to some reports. He's too old to just get started with Bond. And some other people are, they're just too big of a name, or they might not fit the, the right profile or anything. But here's a list of some of the other people that were rumored to be in contention to be Bond, whereas Daniel Craig was supposedly their one main and only choice. I mentioned Hugh Jackman. There's uh, Gerard Butler, who we had talked about with Tomorrow Never Dies. Julian McMahon, who was Doctor Doom in the uh, Jessica Alba Fantastic Four films. Uh, Dominic Star West. Nip Tuck, yeah, as well. Yeah, Nip Tuck. I haven't seen it, but that's that might be what people know him more for. Dominic West, Goran Vizhnik, Alex O'Loughlin. I think it's pronounced O'Loughlin. It might be Laughlin. Ewan McGregor, of course, Obi Wan. Colin Farrell, Sam Worthington was uh, in Avatar and Terminator Salvation and such, and Carl Urban. I don't think any of them would have been a good James Bond. They're great in a lot of other things, but I don't think any of them could have been Bond. I think Cavill would be good. I think... Oh, Cavill, if... yeah, I could see Cavill doing it. Yeah, you had sent me a picture of him because I believe he had tested for it and he looks the part i think he'd be the only one of the names that you mentioned that i could see doing this jackman then was so closely associated with wolverine 
that I don't know if I want to say, oh, look, it's Wolverine, it's Bond. Right. And I think Wolverine was the part for him. He might have been a good James Bond, but I wouldn't sacrifice his Wolverine to get him as Bond. I agree. So just for the sake of casting, some other people who were in consideration for Vesper Lind were all people who I think could have played the part, but not as well. Again, uh, Angelina Jolie, Naomi Watts, Scarlett Johansson, Kira Knightley, Eva Longoria, who, according to one report, she was rejected for being too Hispanic, which is like, uh, comes off a little bit like uh, discriminatory, but whatever. Well, then, but why'd you go for Eva Longoria? Right. You knew what you were getting with Eva Longoria. You're not like, oh, man, I thought that she was, you know, a ginger or something. You know? I've never heard this name before. Right. You know. Uh, Vera Farmiga, Charlize Theron, Jennifer Connelly, Michelle Pfeiffer, who I'm surprised about, Olivia Wilde, who I think could possibly be a pretty good James Bond girl. Uh, for most of them, I think could be Rachel McAdams. I don't think necessarily, but she, you know, she's a great actress. And also Diana Riggs daughter, Rachel Sterling, which that would have been kind of a weird thing, but Hey, you know, weirder things have happened. Also, another note that I have here, just because I have nowhere else to put it, really. Uh, Director Martin Campbell, the one who had returned from he had done Goldeneye. He plays the airport tanker driver who gets killed by Carlos. I didn't know where else to put that other than maybe just shove that in the middle of that scene. But, you know, we have other things to talk about when it comes to that. The most surprising thing there is that you said Michelle Pfeiffer and Michelle Pfeiffer in 06. I can't see it. Me neither. I mean, to be honest, you just listed those names, people. It just basically tells me they just went after any Hollywood actress name. Right. Like, they were after a name. Because you said Angelina Jolie, uh, Eva Longoria. It's like, well, wouldn't it's it be like, great if we could get these people? Yeah, sure. But it, Somebody but like it, a Jolie, I could imagine legitimately pulling the part off. But I don't I, think I, she has the the softness to it. I can see them all being part of the franchise. It just feels like, like you would imagine that there's at least would be one name that is more niche out of the ones that you listed. Realistically, Eva Green is probably the most niche out of the ones you've actually mentioned. Yeah. Well, I mean, there might have been, you know, a whole bunch of other people that the screen test just never came out or anything, you know? True. But yeah, it just feels odd that that was quite a essentially just a collection of people who have been in very famous movies both before and since and i guess i guess that's who you go for if it's like going to be a, a major movie as casino royale is going to be but i don't know that it doesn't strike me as very bond to do that they usually don't go for like halle berry is kind of like the the first real incarnation of them going for like a really top like star i think at that time I guess, uh, you know, you change the franchise up a little bit. You got to look into star power and maybe you appease the studio a little bit or something. But it's true, they, but they don't but they don't do that for Quantum of Solace either. Yeah, it's not like it's not like either. Again, we'll talk about that more when we talk about the extra movie. It's not like Olga Korolenko and Gemma Arterton were big names at that time. Maybe it's because they were rebooting the franchise, though, and they were like, oh, let's see who we can get to. Yeah. Not only is Bond back, but we got, you know, Eve Longoria, too, and or Joey, or whatever. So then let's start talking about the movie itself. Let's start off by talking about the gun bar... Oh. <laughs> All right, look, we got a gun barrel. It was quick, but it was effective. I like this opening sequence a lot, and it shows us how... He became a double O. I like it. Instead of the traditional gun barrel, we're in black and white. We go from the MGM logo to the Columbia logo to a shot of a building with a car pulling up in Prague. And my first reaction in the theater was, oh, no. They decided to no longer do the gun barrel. And it's, well, you know, well, it's a different series. We don't have to do it anymore. And we're never going to get one again. I was like, fuck. Now, of course, it's not true, but you're going to hear me bitch about the gun barrel for the next bunch of movies. Uh, some guy that we'll learn is named Dryden heads to his office, and they are waiting for him as Bond, James Bond, to be specific. 
who says, M doesn't mind it if Dryden earns some money on the side, so long as it's not selling secrets. And Dryden's not buying this whole act. He says, you know, if M was concerned about him, she would have sent a double O. And since he's the section chief, he knows whether or not somebody's been promoted to double O status. But Bond's record doesn't reflect that he has two kills for the service of Her Majesty's government. And there's a good little exchange where uh, Dryden's like, you know, it's a shame we barely got to know each other, pulls out his gun, pulls the trigger, and just click, click. And Bond says, well, I know where you keep your gun. I suppose that's something. I love that little bit. Yeah, Yeah, it's a nice clip. Uh, Dryden then knows what's up and he just goes up oh, how did he die in reference to his contact so this guy Fisher is Bond's first kill he basically drowns him in the sink in a bathroom in Pakistan if I remember correctly with this like horror music playing and it's totally not what you would get in the series not to say that it's bad but it's very jarring to be like, oh, wow, this is not a normal Bond film. In some ways, that's good, just to kind of wake the audience up a little bit and, you know, freshen up the formula. But uh, I wouldn't have anticipated that that's the direction that they would have gone back when I was waiting for Casino Royale to come out. I just figured, you know, Gun Barrel starts off and we end up getting some kind of sequence and whatever. And the music is just kind of like, that alone is very unsettling. It works. Uh Dryden calls him out on how that death must have been really tough for Bond. You know, I mean, you you kill somebody and he says he made you feel it, didn't he? Well, you needn't worry. The second is, and before he can say what I'm assuming is much easier or uh, a lot less difficult to handle or, you know, some kind of variation of that, Bond just goes ahead and shoots him and says, yes, considerably. Man. Yeah. Uh, Okay. This, This opening sequence is just so good. It just it's it's short, it's to the point. It you, you the I like the like cut in between Bond just beating the shit out of this guy in the bathroom. And as you say, it is a bit more it's more serious, it's in black and white, so it has that kind of gritty edge to it. But then he pulls out the line of like the second kill is much easier and it says yes considerably, but it's the way that he says it. It's just that you know as soon as he says that line that okay, he's gonna come out with the quips, but this guy's a sociopath. And that's where you want Bond to be, really, at this point. Because it's he he doesn't say it with any emotion, he doesn't say it with like a real amount of humor in his voice, he just says it because he's an arsehole. And that's what you want that's what you want Bond to be to a degree. And I think this set the tone for what what I think is like my general um my my general uh, sense out of the entire movie, which is this is grown up. Like this is yeah. this is serious stuff now. Like this is it's not it's obviously I've loved the fun stuff and I've loved the like more goofy and the crazy gadgets and all the other stuff. But I just after watching this sequence and then just seeing them, how the rest of the movie goes, I just feel okay. They're taking this movie seriously now. It's much different than something like For Your Eyes Only, yeah. Where it's you know I'm gonna jump with my parachute. Uh, uh, not my parachute, my parasol, and that's gonna stop me from you know hurting my legs when I jump down and evade the gunshots and whatever. Like, and, and again, I don't want to take anything away from that. That stuff is really fun, and it was like it, it'd been a fun journey so far. But then I just watched this movie, and I just felt okay. This is it's the weirdest thing. To, this is a movie, like it's that sort of way of going about. It. Like this is, it's, it's to me, it's not just a movie. It's, it's an it could be an Oscar candidate. It could be like this is a movie that I just watched the whole way through and just think, well, even if it, even if there hadn't been like its whole franchise behind it, you start the series with this movie. Like this, if this was the legitimate first Bond movie, you can't really get much of a stronger start than it. So, um, but... I don't think even the jump from Moore to Dalton was as jarring as. The end, the last words that Brosnan says and the last movie that Brosnan is in and the way this starts, it's completely different. It's, as Callum said, it's a grown-up movie. They're trying to take Bond into the straight-up, like, action, thriller kind, which Brosnan started, but this was just, all right, we're here. You know, you, you like movies. 
that are like this in this vein, even kind of what the Fast and the Furious franchise was becoming, you'll enjoy this. So we then see that Fisher wasn't dead from the drowning. He goes for a gun. Bond turns around, though, and shoots, which is our gun barrel. So we got to talk about this. Uh, Callum, you had said we would disagree, and in some ways we're going to, and in some ways we won't. I'm not entirely 100% opposed to the idea of not starting off with the gun barrel and trying to factor that into Bond's first kill and all. In a way, I think it's pretty damn cool, actually, that it gives more meaning to the gun barrel sequence. But what I do hate is a few other things. I absolutely hate how the gun barrel is stylized. Like the actual CGI. Hate it. It's too, like, pointy. And yeah, I'm going to nitpick about something like that. Because, shit, the gun barrel's got a look to it. And that does not look like the gun barrel. I don't like that there isn't the little tracking circles. You know, it's just the one circle. Kind of comes off half-assed to me. I don't know how they would have necessarily factored that in, but to me it's sort of like, well, that's good enough now. It's kind of like when you uh, when you see a shortened form of a commercial and when you see a minute-long commercial and it's got all these extra jokes and then you see the other one and it's like, okay, here's you know, the beginning and the end of the commercial and that's still good enough because it's just, hey, Doritos kind of a thing. Don't like it. Third, and this is something I'm going to harp on quite a bit for the entirety of the Daniel uh, Craig run, so you're going to get sick of me saying this, everybody who's listening, and you too, guys. But I need to say it here among other places. I absolutely hate that Daniel Craig's films have been a setup where the first two spend about a dozen situations where they say, this is before he was Bond, but now he's Bond. But not really, because now he's Bond. Except not really, because now, for real, you guys, now he's Bond. And by the time you get to the third film, when there's no excuse for this point for him to not be a fully formulated James Bond the way we know him, they go straight into, ah, he's over the hill and he should just retire. What the fuck? It's the same exact problem that happens with Batman Begins and the Dark Knight, and then, whoops, Dark Knight Rises, he's retirement already. So I hate how the opening of this doesn't follow through with it for the whole rest of the movie and the movie that follows it and the movie that follows it. Because in theory, the black and white stuff before Bond, we, before we get to know him and the whole like, well, that leads to the gun barrel and that's the gun barrel you're going to be seeing going forward. You tweak a couple of the things like the I don't like the actual gun barrel itself. It's a very cool concept. But then you spend two entire whole movies where you're like, yeah, but he's not Bond yet, but now he's not Bond, and now he's not Bond, and now it's like, oh my god, come on. I would have liked to have seen the gun barrel does that over, and then we see more of like, I guess not even more of, he just goes back to the old Bond, because that wouldn't be Daniel Craig, but less of the, we're going to play every beat as this is the moment type of a thing. So it's not a, a fault with the gun barrel with that, but this is the first of many times I'm going to bring this up. That's a modern trope, I think, in all of entertainment. Once there are bars to reach, it's like, oh, we're going to get there. I, I think that's entertainment in general. I will say, however... As much as I love you, Tony, my God, did I laugh when you were like, yeah, but it's too pointy. Like, that is too <laughs> nitpicky of a complaint. Then your other point is great. It's just, come on, man. The, the gun barrel is too pointy for you. The gun barrel just doesn't look great. I don't like the look of it. Yeah. Uh, can't help you. And the, the blood falls down too fast and everything. I'm like, no, go back to the well, do it again. And it probably would be less of an issue for me, you know, unless they did it worse, but I like the theory. I just don't like the execution. Yeah. I love both. Like I love, <laughs> I love the fact that this is the, this is where they put the gun barrel in because it's different. And 
as I say, I've enjoyed the journey so far, but I like different as well. And I like a different interpretation of it. And I feel I, I wasn't put off by the, the CGI aspect of thing. I think it actually looked pretty natural. And I think that the blood coming down was a good effect on top of that as well. It was just, yeah, it was CGI, but I don't feel like it was an overbearing amount. It certainly wasn't die another day. So I'm not going <laughs> to complain about it too much. I think that it all fit together really well, especially when you, he shoots the gun and then you go straight into the um, the soundtrack, like you've going to the opening theme. I think it was just so well put together. It's like one of those moments that if you have watched the franchise and you, I know certain people obviously would be a bit annoyed at the fact that they have taken different interpretation, but if you have missed this franchise a lot and then that scene happens, I can really like imagine people just getting out of their chair and fist pumping and says, fuck yeah, we're right in, back into it just especially after die another day and how much of a shit show that was just like they do that scene and i just feel like yes we're back on track i also want to say since we're talking about the cgi this is the first film where the cgi did not offend me like i actually felt as though it looked the way that i would expect a top grossing film to look when it comes to things like the sky in certain cgi aspects of the movie yeah, there's no uh, surfing scenes that end up having an issue like Die Another Day, that's for sure. And the visuals, by the way, in the main opening title sequence that we, we are starting to transition to are fantastic. Oh, there's all this it, playing card imagery, bullets and knives, being clubs and spades and diamonds and all. There's this whole thing with hearts uh, used as blood and veins. Uh, Vesper is seen as the queen of spades card which is apparently also dubbed the bitch which is perfect mm. yeah yeah this um this opening sequence is the is the best one so far and it might be the best one throughout the entire franchise it's just and it's it's odd because it's the it's the first one that really breaks from the formula because it's it's imagery of bond essentially it's a silhouetted version of bond beating up bad guys like leaving them as you say just bleeding out and stuff like that it's like images of cards and uh suits a card suit separating when the guys fall down like i love the shot of the um this there's like a guy that's obviously painted yellow and stuff like that falling from the sky and you just see his face falling because i love people falling that's a really bond thing <laughs> for me. and so him falling and then just like disintegrating into many different uh suits i can't, I can't remember what suit he was in particular but and then they it's just they have so many nice little um elements to it like the um i think my favorite part is the the two, it shows the seven of diamonds or seven of hearts i can't remember which one but and then it's two gunshots into next to the seven for the 007 yeah yeah these people have taken this these people know what they're doing they're taking this seriously and just yeah i i think it's just the visuals are just awesome now tony did you have a problem with the fact that there were no like dancing girls in the visuals I would have at least put one of them in there. Okay, well, I, I got that news for you. I'm surprised, I'll say this, that they knew enough to know 15 years ago, okay, we can take out the girls. But this is the best opening sequence. When I eventually rank all the opening sequences, this is number one. Uh, this this song is the greatest. I think I'm going to be the only one that says that, but that's okay. Don't care. Everything about this opening sequence is fucking perfect. Yeah, see, I would have at least put one silhouette of a woman in there and had that be like, you know, she's made up out of the hearts or something like that. I would have not had, because again, you're going to hate me for it. You go with the status as 007 confirmed on there, and the I don't like the close up of Daniel Craig's face at the end, especially because this would that means now there's three now he's James Bond moments in the first six and a half minutes of the film. Um, but by and large, it's like a a nine point eight out of ten for this because it's amazing the visuals that they've got going on here. Absolutely, absolutely love them. The song, I don't rank that super high, but. I don't want that to be taken as that I don't like the song. I love the song as a song. But for a Bond theme, I rank it a lot lower than Rob does. 
for instance. Rob's got it at number one right now. I've got it at number 15. Below Only Myself to Blame, above Moonraker. Because to me, if you didn't tell me it's a Bond theme, I wouldn't know it's a Bond theme. And I do rank a little bit based off of does it have that Bondian feel to it? Great, great song. Catchy as hell. I love how David Arnold incorporates it into the score. I even agree with the idea behind it when I was listening to the commentary about it, where they were talking about, you know, well, if this is all about James Bond becoming James Bond, let's make the song about Bond and not about the Casino Royale, which isn't factored too much into, you know, three quarters of the movie. Or let's not make it all about Vesper because... We've got some other things that could do that too, but so it doesn't rank super duper high for me, but that's not to say I don't like it. Cause I actually really love the song. That one's got yeah, a number think, four right now. So you, you're more on the, on the Rob side of that. Well, let me just say this real quick. I've been listening to this song continuously. It's been in my regular rotation since 2006. So that definitely plays a role, but after watching 20 of these films, lyrically and understanding how this connects to Bond, I, I just love it even more. Go ahead, Cal. Yeah, I'll say that. I, I really enjoy the, the lyrical side of this. I think the, the, the song isn't strictly, as Tony says, Bondian, but I kind of has moved beyond that point, thinking that there is a set formula for a Bond theme. It's just whether I now I've gone to the point of just whether I like the song or I don't like the song. And I feel like it is, as I say, catchy, ridiculously catchy. It's got such a great, I think the vocals are great. I think the the actual like guitar riffs, it's just, it, it's very much more of akin to like, if you're going from one side of the spectrum to the other between, it's more of a view to a kill than Diamonds Are Forever, let's say. Yeah. It's more that side. It's, sort of tune but i'm yeah i'm a big fan of the way that they they present that one and i just love the fact that it is about bond and it is about re-establishing that character because i mean a big thing we're going to be talking about between now and the end of the series is the fact that now it's a uh, for the first time bond is now in kind of an arcing story across all of the movies whereas previously it's been more of a there has been some obviously callbacks and stuff like that but it's more just been a one-offs a mixture of one-offs whereas this one is going to be okay it's going to weave more from one movie to the next there's going to be more of a chronology to it and i feel like having a, a song in the, initially which just establishes who bond is and and really make it's, it still references all the old stuff, like the idea of like um, seeing this diamond cut through harder men and stuff like that. So you can just talk about mm. the fact that, OK, other people have played this character before. And it almost like plays into the idea that people maybe the doubts that people had about Craig taking on the role. And just like the idea of like it's basically setting him up as saying, OK, a lot of people don't think that you're Bond material. And we're going to make an entire song based around that fact. And I, I think that's pretty um, that's pretty ingenious, really. One of the songs that was sent in and rejected is by Hugh Neal, if I'm remembering correctly. And it's called Casino Royale. And I actually really love some of the lyrics. I really love the song itself. I would have been cool with it being the main theme instead of You Know My Name and You Know My Name being the backup track, kind of like Surrender and Tomorrow Never Dies. Because this song, Casino Royale by Hugh Neal, has lyrics like, Casino Royale, it's like heaven and hell where the stakes are so high you can play with your life. Casino Royale, if you're under its spell, it's not you who decides because the, the cards will choose who lives and who dies. I'm like, man, that's really cool. I really wish that that could have had a part somewhere in the movie. I wanted to shout that out just because not a lot of people probably know about Hugh Neal's Casino Royale theme. But You Know My Name is, it never was going to be close to the, the top for me, but it's a song that I can listen to at any time and it's fucking pitching. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, you're going to hear like, uh, it's got the rock theme kind of thing going on and it's not a view to a kill to me, but it's also not our next one. When we get into our next one, oh boy, 
<laughs> so it's a major thumbs up overall when it comes to the main theme, the opening title sequence. I also and... want to shout out because you had shown this to me during a uh, Patreon exclusive. The version of this that was put to a sting song. And oh yeah, the shape of my heart works so well with it. Very well done. That's another song. That song's so amazing. I love that song. One of my favorites. So it's time for some pinball. In the middle of U- uh, Uganda, where it's pouring rain. Apparently, and I didn't even notice this until I looked that up. This is the first movie in the whole series where it rains. Hmm. There hasn't been a single scene that rains in any of the other movies. That can't be 20 true. films. Isn't that crazy? Uh. That's insane. Yeah, that is that is bizarre. But, <laughs> I mean, I guess they always conveniently place Bond in like really hot locations all the time. Like it doesn't rain much in Miami or the desert or some some place like that. So, so yeah, it's just and Bond's not even in this scene anyway. So yeah, it's weird. So I don't remember if there's any raining scenes in the other ones or not. This might be the only one that has rain, but there might be, you know, a shot inspector or something that I'm not familiar with. So terrorist, or shall I say freedom fighter, Stephen Obano, who, by the way, I always uh, thought it was funny that his name is Stephen. Like, I don't picture that guy being like, hi, Steve. You know, (laughs) Uh, he is there. He's talking to the mysterious Mr. White and eventually Le Chiffre about how he's hiring them for banking services. Of course, you know, we know that that's not legitimately like, hey, go to Wells Fargo kind of a thing. Obano asks Lashif if he believes in God. Lashif says no, he believes in a reasonable rate of return, (laughs) which I think is so good. (laughs) So now that Lashif has millions of dollars of Obano's money that he's going to allow him to access at any point. It's basically like he's laundering the money and, you know, kind of going through a middleman sort of system. Well, chief calls up a stock guy and he says to invest in Dogecoin at GameStop. And it works out because a couple of years later, you know, <laughs> it becomes Cameron Grimes. Yeah, right. Anybody else can kiss his grits. If you have no idea what we're talking about, go to smartcutmoment.com. Check out all the stuff on there. It's pro wrestling thing. It's NXT. Um, now, he says, short the stock in this airline, Skyfleet, and he's going against the market. Now, this scene sounds boring as shit, but it isn't because we're meeting some characters. we got the ring going on. It's just kind of setting the scene and all that. But, of course, if you say after these opening credits, we go into a banker talking about the stock market, that it would be like, oh my God. But no, it doesn't work out that way. Filmed very well. Big fan of that whole thing. Yeah, it, it sets the context and you, you establishes who the predominant villain is going to be in this movie and it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's less than five minutes. Yeah. Now, if they would have made this some 20-minute discussion like they would have done probably around Dr. No's time, then that would have been really dragging it out. But elsewhere... In Madagascar, to be exact, a mongoose and a snake are having a Pokemon battle, Zangoose and Saviper style, and Bruno wins. So he moves on to the Elite Four, and <laughs> uh, they're doing this whole thing. Bond and another agent, Carter, are scoping out this guy named Malaka, who is a bomb maker. And Bond keeps telling Carter, stop putting your hand to your ear. Because yeah. rightfully so, Malaka sees this. And he knows he's being watched, so he runs. It's like, God damn it, Carter. I would know that that wouldn't be a thing you should do. And I don't know shit when it comes to this. Fucking Carter, it, you know? <laughs> it's it's one of those bizarre situations where, like, Bond's been teamed up with someone who cl- he clearly knows is not particularly good at his job. Right. And, and it's one of those things where he's telling him to put his hand down. But because he can't hear what Bond's saying through the right. noise people, he's just keeping his hand in place. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just okay, this car guy needs to go, pretty much. <laughs> and I would have been I would have been happy if he'd been shot and killed at this point. But um, he does, he, I mean, he goes for a shot and he ends up getting thrown into the snake pit. So we don't, we don't know what happens to him beyond that point. Yeah, nobody ever says what happens to Carter. So maybe well, he clearly got... clearly he was useless, so that's a good thing. Yeah. 
I mean, uh, M doesn't say like, you know, and one of our agents died and whatever like that. So Carter probably got out of it and just went, oh, where the fuck they went, you know? Well, well yeah, because I'm, oh, I imagine like it was him and like five other people fell into a, like I imagine they probably just killed both the snake and the mongoose by landing on top of them. So I'll write people over them. Cue a foot chase with a bunch of free running because the actor playing Malacca is a free runner. So, you know, that's it's- why I got the part and all. <laughs> What, yeah, one of the things I love about this scene in particular, and I know obviously it goes on, it goes on for a while, and so just some of the shots in particular are just amazing. But I love the fact that this guy that Bond's chasing is this awesome parkour master and can do all this cool shit. And Bond is chasing after him, but he's so clumsy and he's so like, <laughs> and he's so just brute forcing his way through things because he can't do the same acrobatic skill. And yet he still manages to keep chasing him in that regard. It just feels like so typical Bond to me. It's like almost like just brute force your way into this into the best situations while the other people are being so deliberate and careful about everything they're doing. And Bond just says, fuck this, I'm just gonna, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna burst through the wall, I'm gonna just kick things over, I'll land on my back multiple times. Just but yeah, I mean, the, the basic story being told here is like Malaka's got all these agile maneuvers and Bond's answer to things are if he's not able to use some kind of like innovative way to get around like, you know, tools and everything like that, he just kind of rams into things and nothing he does is smooth. It's not like this is the James Bond that's going to land gracefully and just kind of be like, you know, dust myself off and you know, uh, my tuxedo is perfectly pressed and everything. But there's moments of it that are really cool when, like, for instance, he does have some kind of finesse. Like, uh, Malaka throws his gun at Bond. Bond catches it and throws it back at him. I like that part. I'm not a fan of the goddamn Kool-Aid man part where he busts through the wall. <laughs> just because it I, does. I thought, I thought that was hilarious because, like, this guy just... Like he um limbo style goes under like Spider Man style just goes under this really small gap in the wall and I'm just thinking what what's what, how does Bond get through this one and then he just bursts through the wall and I just burst out laughing because it's just <laughs> that's just so what Bond would do in that situation <laughs> well this Bond would do in that situation is just oh god I literally can't do anything about the situation let's just go through the wall and see what happens <laughs> it's a good thing that it's construction and it's not a like already secure full wall type of thing so. Oh yeah, that was, that was one of the things that like is a bit. Um, I'm one of the few things I don't like about this scene, or I find a little bit like over the top about this scene. And this is a scene that has a lot of stuff that's over the top. But it's um, when they start climbing up the like the girders on the construction site. Um, the uh, the bomb maker throws one of the people to the floor with a kind of gas canister, and it causes this massive explosion to come up straight away. And I just feel like, okay, you kind of did that because you just wanted an explosion. Like, like that would not happen. Yeah, they should have very slightly tapped one of the cars. That could have given them that explosion instead. Yeah, exactly. I do like the idea that this Bond is just starting out, isn't as polished, or he's just like, I can't do the shit this guy's doing. I'm just going to shoot the scissor lift. It'll go down, and I'll run through a wall if I need to, because I know what my job is, and I will do my job, but I can't do it smooth because I'm not experienced. And he just storms his way into an embassy, goes into the office, grabs a gun. Like, there's nothing at all wrong with what he's all doing. All the cameras are on. All yeah, the cameras are on. Yeah. Nothing problematic at all, right? It's not going to create an incident. And despite specifically telling Carter that he needs Malacca alive, Bond goes ahead and shoots him and some canister nearby to create an explosion, seemingly killing nobody. It's a perfect shot, you know? Mm. And uh, it gives him an opportunity to escape with Malacca's bag featuring a bomb and a cell phone that he is able to decipher the code phrase ellipsis. Now this, this is of course a big plot point. This drives the story forward. So it's not one of those things where it's just sort of there for the sake of it. And then let's move on and do another completely different plot or something. I'm a big fan of that. Uh, It's a good way to show that this bond is a lot rougher around the edges. Yeah, absolutely. I think, it shows that, but it's also just this really cool, fast-paced action scene to really get the movie going. Because if, like, you were a bit worried going into it, and then you see that scene that we discussed earlier about the um, the stock market and all that other stuff, and you just feel like, oh, my God, it's not going to be that kind of movie. Then you turn up in Madagascar, and you've got this massive, like, five-minute-long chase scene, and 
like them fighting on top of a huge crane, these giant leaps off the side. Like I, it, it's almost like, you know that Bond's obviously not going to die because it's really early on in the movie anyway, but just the, the moments where he does that giant leap from one crane to the other, and you just go, fuck, that's, that's terrifying. And the best thing about it is the fact that because he is so rough around the edges and he is so just gung-ho about all this stuff, they're just... He almost feels like what you... I don't want to... I don't want to make it sound like it's like an everyman thing, but it almost feels like... It almost feels like what I would do if I was Bond. Like... Let's be like clear. If, I, if Bond, I were Bond, I wouldn't have been able to get five minutes into no. the chase sequence. <laughs> yeah. no, I, no, I don't mean it like that as if, like, if I was it, but it's kind of like it's more of a case of... He doesn't feel like he's... He, it, it's a weird juxtaposition where it's like he he obviously feels like he's a superhero to a degree because he's doing all this cool stuff, but he's doing it in such a clumsy way that you know that he's mortal. It's like it's it's it's, it's different than the other bonds where they've done they do stuff with such finesse and ease in certain places that it just feels like they're an ethereal being almost. Whereas this guy feels like okay, he's he's taken some of the god juice, but he hasn't taken all of it. He's like Achilles with the heel issue, something like that. It's, a, it's probably a really weird analogy, but it just he feels like an everyman hero to me. Like I, I find that more endearing. I well, think, I think it makes uh, sense. Yeah. It's weirder not the the Achilles thing. It's weirder that you said he's he's taking the god juice because now I'm imagining that's what the vodka martinis are this whole time. <laughs> well, I think it makes sense. You know, again, this guy isn't polished, and I think after twenty movies of just. Oh, he's indestructible. They probably wanted to send the message by saying, "Hey, he's not as, you know, he can be vulnerable. He doesn't yeah. have to just be. Oh, look, he landed fine." Yeah, that's and that's a significant thing throughout not just this scene but throughout the entire movie. The Bond gets beaten the fuck up more than probably any other movie in the entire franchise so far in this movie. Like, he is he's vulnerable, and that's something that I'm just not used to seeing with Bond so far. And I kind of like, again, I like the change of pace that this one delivers. This Bond bleeds. Mm. I remember seeing that all over the place as reviews for this movie. And it shows that this one did not take Q's advice. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, uh, let's be real. He hasn't met Q at this point. He's just, they're just getting started. Nor has he developed an escape plan. <laughs> so we then see Valenka. An attractive blonde woman who will have, I think, no lines except for no. Like screaming uh, no. She says, I'm sorry. She says, I'm sorry. Oh, that's right. She says, I'm sorry. Um, she never has her name spoken. She contributes not well, too much to the movie. Well, that, that, that's the thing I was talking about. You mentioned a load of people's names earlier on. Yeah, Malaka doesn't have his name really specifically said either. Yeah, no, it's just like, so I'm just like writing my notes because I'm not checking like Wikipedia and stuff like that because I'm just trying to watch the movie and stuff and then put some notes down. I'm just writing this guy, this person, yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah, Stephen Obano, Lashif, Mr. White, uh, Malaka, Carter. Well, they say Carter's name. Um, but this girl is Valenka and she's Lashif's girlfriend. Uh, Lashif, of course, to get more information about him, he has a defect with his eye docs where he weeps blood, and as he says, nothing sinister. Uh, he shows off that he is awesome at poker because he reads his opponent's mathematical odds, and he wins a hand just sort of, you know, you have this type of a thing, the odds that you're going to win this, whatever, so you're going to fold, you're going to do this, and that'll happen, whatever, and the guy's just like, all right, fuck it, yeah. We also get to see that he frequently uses an inhaler and doesn't at all use it the way that I was taught to use my inhaler as a kid. Where you need to fully breathe out, shoot a puff, then slowly breathe in and try to hold your breath for a little bit. So maybe the medicine's not properly going down his lungs. Or maybe I was taught wrong. I don't know. But I always find that interesting when I see that in movies and like, you know, The Simpsons when Millhouse is animated to not do that and stuff. I'm like, all right, somebody's doing it wrong. Either me or somebody else's. But the older woman in this scene, by the way, is Madame Wu. She pops up later in the main card game. And take a guess where we've seen her before. So I imagine that she's from a previous Bond movie. She is indeed. Is she, again, I don't want to just like profile her essentially, but is she Aki? Nope. Unfortunately not. 
You want to take a guess? He one of them. Is that the movie she's in now? She is in You Only Live Twice, yes. You know, I don't feel comfortable taking a guess. <laughs> well, because the only other guess that you can make is that it's either Kissy Suzuki or it's one of the just women in the bathhouse. Nope. Okay. That's not even none, none of them. She is Ling, the one who sets Bond up at the beginning to get shot up in oh. the bed. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a nice touch. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Very cool. Uh, after that, we get into a sequence with uh, with M. We get to meet her. Bef- before we move into that, just because we- we've met Le Chiffre now, how good is Mads Mikkelsen as an actor? He is great in every single thing I've seen him in. He is a better Hannibal than... Uh, Anthony Hopkins is in my mind he brings gravitas to even stuff like Star Wars he is great in Polar he's uh, he's he's fan fucking tastic I just just look at just the way that he talks throughout this entire movie and just the way that he acts he is I, I can't think of someone so far that maybe there's been a couple of people but I can't feel like there's many people so far that just ooze the Bond villain feel more than this guy does just the way that he speaks the accent the way that i mean he's not a, he's, i would say he's a bad looking guy but he has a kind of unique appearance which really lends himself to the role as well and obviously he has the eye problem but that's because they've because every bond villain needs to have some sort of physical defect yeah most so of them just, do yeah and so they decide to go okay he's got one really bad eye and he bleeds uh he bleeds tears essentially and or Christ blood is probably the better way of going about that. But uh but yeah, it's I just feel like his his <laughs> performance is incredible in this movie. Now I'm picturing like he gets cut on his arm and tears come out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I was, I was getting that wrong. <laughs> uh yeah, fantastic. In everything I've ever seen him in. And he really adds to this movie as well. We're gonna talk about our rankings for him, but uh we're all in agreement he's very high. Um, but we do get to meet them, and she's played by Judy Dench again. And so many people do this thing where they're like, "You see, she's the same character as before. That means the Bond is a code." No, no, no. She's a different woman entirely. She just happens to be played by the same actress. The previous M is Barbara Maudsley. This time, the continuity has been reset, and she's Olivia Mansfield. She is just a completely different character. Who happens to be played by the same character, uh, the same actress? So I don't want to hear it in the comments. Precedent for that in the franchise. Yep. So like the one of the previous M's could have been Admiral Hargraves. It might not have been. This one, no, she is not the same M, and that we carry over that there used to be a James Bond before. By the time we get to Skyfall, it is cemented. There is and never should be the code name. We'll get to that with Skyfall. Although I did joke to you that uh, Craig looks so different that I'm willing to accept that it is a code name just because this guy looks so different. Uh, To further illustrate that, the last M criticized Bond for being a relic of the Cold War. And this one who, when she's pissed, she says she misses the Cold War. So again, not the same M. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like it. She's accompanied by her assistant, Villiers, who is basically pointless and just somebody for her to talk to, and it's a shame that they didn't go with Bill Tanner like they do in the previous movies. Yeah, it's, it's different like, kind of her P- It's basically her PI. Basically, yeah. he's Money Penny in this movie. Yeah, he's, he's Money Penny without any charm or wit or memorability you know <laughs> well that's why that's why they eventually hire money penny in the later movies yeah, it's a shame that he didn't get fired in the movie or something <laughs> bond looks up some information on a computer he knows where to head next which is the ocean club and it turns out he's actually in m's flat and she rightfully criticizes him for breaking the one rule that he can't break by storming the embassy and that he killed malaka instead of questioning him and 
she also tosses out the whole like uh you know what the fuck you doing in my apartment kind of thing yeah is uh revealing her name that's good i love this little thing uh he's just like you know if she says how the hell do you know where i live he says, oh, the same way I found out your name. I thought that M was a randomly assigned letter. I didn't know that M stood for me. And she just says, you utter one more syllable and I'll have you killed. <laughs> she does that quite a lot in this scene. She basically threatens to kill Bob multiple times. Yeah, it's very much back into the, uh, uh-huh, the yeah. previous M of, oh, uh, here goes the sirens. I'm sorry, everybody. That's because uh, we, we threatened to say M's name. There it is. Yeah, that's the sirens coming out to, you know, have us killed. It's Olivia like Mansfield. M's name. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Olivia. But, uh, yeah, the old M being the whole, like, you know, oh, I wish that Scaramanga would have shot you dead, you fuck, kind of thing. Like, uh, But she's pissed for a lot of good reasons, you know. She says Bond needs to make judgment calls. She can't uh, have him just going around shooting people for the sake of it. He killed a nobody. And he says, well, he did make a judgment call. He figured that one less bomb maker in the world would be a good thing. <laughs> Again, it's just it, he's he's got the humor. He's got the humor, but it's just more deadpan. Yeah, than previous Bonds would do. I love that line. That's one of my favorite lines in the movie because it's true. He's just kind of like, yeah, yeah, you know, I did make a judgment call. Fuck him. <laughs> but, but I love like M is kind of approaching this as like a mentor would almost like obviously a disappointed mentor at this point. But it's just the idea that she says like it was a mistake to promote him, or, like saying that maybe too soon to make him a double O. And then he talks about the fact that like, any thug can kill. And the idea of like just Bond is, at the moment is behaving like a thug would do, just like going in all guns blazing and just doing what he f- feels like he wants to do. And saying that she wants Bond to start approaching missions more dispassionately. Yeah, the don't, idea that he's uh, don't kill based off of your ego. Um, ego's, a big, ego's a big theme in this movie as well. Yeah. He had, says the line, uh, you know, I you want me to be half monk, half hit man. And he also says, I understand that double O's have a short life expectancy. So your mistake will be short lived, very cold between these two, lots of tension, but it is a mentor kind of role. And she uses a phrase that we've referred to several other times. And they, I think that they refer to it another time, but uh, she calls bond a blunt instrument. That's like their go-to explanation of, how that is you know don't be a blunt instrument don't be somebody who is just there to be a hitman you're not there to be a hitman hence you're supposed to be half monk you are there to make the right judgment calls here you have to assess the situation try to get the best out of the things that you can you have a license to kill but you're not supposed to just be killing everybody essentially i think it's great yeah he's Relationships are the strongest in the uh, latter films, these Bond M relationships. And that is reflected in something that he says here. He calls her mom. It's a trademark of this continuity that wasn't in the previous one. Brosnan never called M mom, but he actually calls her mom more than he calls her M. Especially in uh, Quantum of Solace. Initially, I didn't like it, but by the time we got to Skyfall, I grew to absolutely positively love that little trademark, and it's something that's a through line for four different movies, essentially, where, not to spoil it, but that mother-son kind of relationship is a big, big factor, and it's fantastic, so I love that he's like, you know, okay, mom, kind of thing, just because... Uh, her name's M. Call her mom, you know. Do, do you think he's calling her mom or mom? It's like mom more so, right? No, he's calling her ma- like it's it's mom as in ma'am as in like like how you would address the queen. Like, oh, see, like, I always took it as mom, like it's more like mother. Oh man, you're just about to shatter Tony's whole thing here. No, she, he's not calling. He's not calling her like a mo- actual mother thing. That's how you would refer to essentially like a woman in a, like a formal woman in a position of power ah, that's M-A, it's m-a apostrophe a-m 
So like ma'am. So it's yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's that... ma'am. But he's British, so he says it with a lot. You know, he says it better than we would. You know what? <laughs> this movie blows. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like it because it's like it's him. In, in my mind, it's him feigning respect towards her even though everything he does towards her action wise is disrespectful. But when he's verbally talking to her with that thing, like even though they've had just like this verbal sparring session, he still demonstrates either an element of respect or just joking about showing some respect by calling her mom at the end of it. And maybe she doesn't like being called that or anything like that, but he feels like, okay, we've had another war of words and I've broken into your apartment and all this other stuff. So I'm just going to call you mom on the way out just to see, just to make it feel like, okay, I, I do respect you to a degree. I'm keeping my head cannon. <laughs> You're more than welcome better. to it. I just like I'm just telling you how British people speak. So I blame that's, that's my role. That's my role in this whole thing. It's just to actually talk the British side of it. I blame the entire UK then. <laughs> no, fair. I mean that boy brought the whole franchise what, to what this in the first Rhodes? place, so Yeah. So let's go over to the Ocean Club here. I mentioned before, David Arnold factors in the you know my name thing great, especially when he's casually driving in the Bahamas. And I love this parking lot scene. Oh, good. Can I just talk about the fact that obviously we'll talk about the parking lot scene, but my favorite part about this uh, build up is him driving a Ford rental car. (laughs) And I'm just going, like, okay, like Q would be so upset with you right now (laughs) If if he was still around. It's just a case of. Yeah, it's not an Aston Martin, it's not a Jaguar or anything like that. It's just a Ford rental car. It's just a guy driving a rental car. You got to get that product placement in, baby. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so in the parking lot, this guy thinks that he's a valet, tosses his keys to him, real douchebag, you know, like, hey, you know, park this shit, whatever. And Bond just goes along with it. Mm-hmm. Rams the guy's car into a barricade to set off dozens of car alarms, which, and then he throws away the key, which I think is a great little touch, too. Not only is it a great distraction to allow him to go snooping, but it's also just a great Bond is an asshole moment. So, of course, I love it. No, yeah, it is just awesome because it's like you just you watch it initially and you just feel like he's doing it to be a dick. Because he's this hot head. You, all we've established so far is these, this really like hot headed individual. And he's just doing that to piss him off. But then you just see all the security going in and Bond just sneaking into it. So you, there was a method to the madness. He just did it in the way that it amused him the most. So I love that. Yeah, Bond is never above making only himself laugh. <laughs> oh, and uh, Tennis Girl number one, the one who gives him the googly eyes, Alessandra Ambrosio. Just a little Where I've seen her from. Uh, she's a Playboy Playmate. Oh, okay. Like one of the more like famous ones over the years. So I know where you saw her from. Yeah, from Casino Royale. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I- I'm surprised they never got a Hugh cameo in a Bond film. Yeah, he's just kind of like uh, the last scene is, you know, some kind of quip off with innuendo between him and Hugh Hefner. Yeah. So Bond checks out the security footage, syncs it up with the phone messages. He knows who to go after, or at least uh, whose car to go after a little bit more. And that sets up some more sleuthing. He makes up the story for the front desk girl about how he nicked an Aston Martin last night. And he wants to apologize to the owner. And she's like, well, you know, I that's Mr. Uh, Demetrios. I wouldn't really apologize. And he's like, well, if I feel so inclined, where could I find the guy? Great, great flirtation, sleuthing spy work type of stuff there. That's some old school Connery type stuff. Yep. Yeah. There. Just like, just like the idea that he's so insistent about, cause she just like tries to warn him away from talking to Demetrius because she knows what he's like. And he's just so insistent about it. But he's got, he's got the charm about him that she eventually gives him the information. And that's classic bond. And what else could you really want? That's something that Connery would have done. That's something that Moore would have done. Brosnan, less so Dalton. Dalton's more of the uh, getting angry at Carter <laughs> kind of side of things. So then we get the now, uh, now, I added some extra letters to that one, the now iconic shot of Daniel Craig walking out of the water in Honey Rider type fashion, which wasn't really the plan. He was supposed to swim and he got up to the sandbank and he 
thought that he just looked stupid, so he just started to walk up, and they were like, oh, that looks good. Do that. A lot of people go nuts over it. To me, it's, yeah, it's just like, all right, well, this Bond's really fit, you know? Yeah, you know what I appreciate about it? It's just, it's about time the women got something out of watching these movies. That's true. Just from a sex appeal standpoint. It's not like it's not like some of the other guys that have been on the on the movies before haven't been bad looking by any stretch of the imagination, especially the Bonds. But this is the first time we've really seen a him Bond. being sexualized. Yeah, and that's just like yeah, go like you go go both him for like being allowed, for being willing to do that sort of thing, and go all the women in the audience for getting to see that because this is something that I've seen. I saw so many people talking about this like in the late 2000s and stuff like that just it was just posted about all over the place and it's just it's like that sort of thing that you kind of like if you were to go to I can't, how old was i when this movie came out i think i was about this is 06 yeah i was six i would have been i would have been a, yeah it would have been about 13 14 yeah and so it's one of those movies that if you were to go see it with your parents in the cinema and your mum got a little bit <laughs> like uh, <laughs> Like googly eyes and stuff like that. It's like one of those things that you just get super embarrassed about. Uh, I, I will say, if you're going to do this with any Bond, I would have done it with Brosnan. But go Craig for starting to show that, hey, not only do women deserve eye candy, but men can be sexy too. So definitely drop a comment below. Tell us if he left you shaken or stirred <laughs> when you watch that. Scene. You know, you know, you know. I just like I just love about this scene as well is just the fact that can you imagine how many awkward conversations that this led to in like car rides home and stuff like that of like, like why don't you look like James Bond? That's just like that <laughs> that sort of stuff. And then the response one's like, why don't you look like Vesper? <laughs> you know? This we, this was the this was the scene that caused a thousand breakups. Right. Uh, especially because right afterward we see this beautiful woman on horseback. We never get to know her name, just like many of the other people in here. Despite the fact that the song "You Know My Name," not many people get actually named in this, but we her name. Them. Well, because you know them. Okay. Her name is Solange. She, this name I think was used in two different Fleming stories, but she's not a character from the Fleming novels or anything, and. While we see Solange, we see that, uh, or here more so, that David Arnold has brought back a variation of the love theme motif that I've mentioned multiple times by now. I absolutely love. So I'm going to talk about it again a little bit later on, but that's our introduction to Solange. And the actress, Katerina Marino, had injured her legs from horseback riding and had to do the scene where she was just like in lots of pain. So, credit to her, too, because you can't tell. Yeah, good on her. Emma's woken up in the middle of the night while she's sleeping next to her husband, who is played by the film's transport coordinator. They were like, uh, you, you could be uh, Emma's husband, <laughs> you know? <laughs> she's learned. Imagine that, you're the, the transport dude is just kind of like, all right, let's make sure everybody goes around here and stuff. Oh, wait, I get to be M's husband in these, or boyfriend or whatever. They never say specifically husband, but you kind of can assume. Immortalized forever. Yeah, even though you don't see his face, but it's like, that's me. I fucked Judy Dench kind of thing. Like, yeah. She's alerted that Bond has logged into the system using her information, her like username and password and all that, which is funny. And uh, Villiers can see who this Bond is looking into, and he is looking into all these people like Le Chiffre and Demetrios and everybody. Another great little moment there, especially with M just being like, how does he know these things? You know, like, goddamn. It is quite interesting just because he, we're led to believe that he's only recently just become a double O. So clearly he must have figured all this shit out a while ago. Right. And just feel like, okay, now now Emma's thrown into double O. He feels like he's a bit more maybe open to reveal the stuff that he knows about them already. He can get away with it now. <laughs> yeah. Now, follow me on this. I know that might seem like a bit of a jump, but it's almost like if Boris from Goldeneye had charm and chose to use his intelligence and slight creepiness for good. Because... Clearly, Bond has, as Callum said, you know, been building this knowledge and had all this stuff ready to go. 
it's Tarah, he's on the good side. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't look as bad as Boris. Not that Boris was terrible looking, but just, you know what I mean. Well, at least that would explain why he never gets killed in any of these movies, because then he would be invincible. That's right. Saban joins Demetrios at a poker table, and the woman next to Demetrios at that poker table, guess where we've seen her before? Okay, so I, I, I can't remember what she looks like off the top of my head, so it could legitimately be anybody, but I'm assuming it's another Bond. Another, another former person for a Bond movie. Yep. But I legitimately can't remember what she looks like, so you'll get Myself it. being unable to remember what she looks like, I'm just going to say she was in A View to a Kill in some fashion. She was in Thunderball. Damn it. Wow, even third, though. She was the one, uh, the woman that Bond dances with before he dances with Fiona. Of course, I, I, of course I like nobody nobody would know like you off the top of their heads, but it's just like, yeah, you know, let's put her in there. That'd be kind of fun. Like, it's cool. I like it. I, I like the fact they might have just sent some like giant group email to everybody that's been part of the Bond franchise and just like said, are you interested in being in Casino Royale and just seeing what mm-hmm. the response they get? Yeah, fun little bits of trivia there. Uh, Solange comes in and she is looking good t- with a T, Booker T style. And that's a distraction for Bond, which he's going to apply later. Very smart. You got a setup there. Yep. It, it, yeah, she looks awesome in that dress. Mm. Just, it's it's one of those, again, I'm kind of at that age where it's kind of, okay, this is a bit of an awakening moment for me. <laughs> yeah. And it makes it so much better because Demetrios is an ass. He just blows her off. She kisses him and he goes, oh, if that was for luck, you're two hours late. So she just goes and sits and sulks, and it's like, ah, oh, man, like, here this beautiful woman comes by, gives him a kiss. You would think in any other scenario, it would be like, this is amazing. And he's just like, you know, ugh. You hurt You're again. late. Like, you, you pathetic. You loser. You were late. I don't need yeah. you. I don't, I don't need your kisses. You're two hours late. So you immediately don't like Demetrios. You're just like, all mm-hmm. right, fuck this guy. And then you're just ready for Bond to fuck this one, essentially. Oh, yeah, too, because once she sulks, it's like, Bond's going to put a smile on her face. We know that. Vengeance fucking, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> to be fair, yeah. Bond leaves her. No, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. But like, he doesn't, he doesn't, she doesn't even get that. But I, I feel very sorry for Solange. <laughs> so Demetrios can't buy in more. It's just table stakes. And he wagers his keychain, meaning his car, because that's on the table, which I find really cool. And I love that Bond is all nice here. Oh, give him a chance to win his money back, knowing that he's got the winning hand with two aces. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And to rub it in even more, he just goes, oh, and the valet ticket. (laughs) It's so fucking good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it, it is just great. He is very, very jovial and sociable in this situation, really. Like, because he just joins the table and just starts talking to people as normal and he just keeps playing and then eventually wins the hand. And you, at, at this point, you're just starting, okay, Bond's great at poker. As we, as people who have watched this series before will already know that Bond is great at card games. But yeah, it, it's, a ni- it's a nice little um, introduction to that for people that w- would be unaware. Practically any moment where James Bond is a total jerk and it's not like, a really like you know sexist thing or something like that mm. is like top notch to me so like the the whole valet ticket thing is just like man you set this guy up that's so good <laughs> but then you, he so obviously he's pissed about that but then he immediately receives this message from someone and he just gets up and walks away having lost this a uh, presumably significant amount of money and his car yeah and then, and then it, following yeah. that, we get a whole situation where Solange sees that car pull up and she naturally just thinks that it's Alex and says, once well, she notices that it's Bond, oh, no wonder he's in such a foul mood because she's just like, oh, he just lost the car. So whatever, my mistake. But Bond offers to give her a ride and they flirt and she says, oh, I'm, I'm not that cruel, you know, to send him into like a bigger fit by like, you know, going with her temptations with Bond and he says, oh, you just might be a little bit out of practice. It invites her for a drink to his place, which is very, very close, and literally circles back to exactly where they were, because after all, that's where he's staying. And it's so smooth. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's like this. This Bond is very. Again, it's subtle character. It's it's subtle charisma. It's not over. It's not over the top. And again, I I like the approach that someone like Roger Moore takes. It's very much more very deliberate. But I like the fact that Craig is very understated, but he just has that magnetism to him. Yeah, a yeah. different movie. Um, Roger Moore would have came up behind her and started kissing her immediately. You know, I like that. It took 21 films, but we understand that subtlety is appreciated in these circumstances. And her name is Solange and not like, you know, uh, some kind of like pussy galore Fuck type of name. Fuck me now, please. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, co- that's pronounced Fook me now. <laughs> yeah. uh, Demetrios gets that message. And he uh, beats up with the Lashif. And he says that Malacca's out of the mix now, so he's got a new guy for the job, which we'll eventually find out is Carlos, um, which we don't find out his name either. Uh, meanwhile, Bond and Solange are making out, and it's quite sad, actually, when Solange says, what is it about bad men? You, my husband, I had so many chances to be happy, so many nice guys. Because we know what happens to her a little bit later on. We yeah. see how she's been treated. I feel so yeah. bad for Solange. So and that's why I is, really like Solange. Yeah, it is It is obviously a bad situation just because, again, we know what her inevitable fate is. But just the way that like she talks about that and how she had so many nice guys, but then says, why can't nice guys be more like you? And then Bond just responds, as he would do, saying, well, because then they'd be bad. But so yeah. much more it's interesting. Just, yeah, yeah, but that's, the, that, again, but that's like... It makes me slightly less. Obviously, I, I do feel sorry for her, but it makes me feel slightly less sorry for her because essentially she knows what she's getting into. Oh yeah, I mean but, her uh, husband is an obvious piece of shit involved mm, in crime. Yeah, and she's now like she's cheating on him with this other guy who she also thinks is bad yeah. to a degree, but that's because she finds those people interesting. It, it's one of those things that really hammers in the nail in the coffin of the nice guy approach of things yeah but oh this 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 girl could have been happy with so many other nice guys but yeah she's you know she's fucking the guy who um smokes during class and like uh like cheats on all the tests and stuff like that doesn't do his homework he's like okay but he's cool because he's a bad boy not bitter yep. or anything <laughs> i like that they at least <laughs> try to address it <laughs> You know, Try to like, adjust it in what way? What do you mean? Like they they address the fact that yeah, these women in these films are just attracted to pieces of shit. But at least we're getting somewhere to where they know, hey, I could at least have chosen somebody better or made better decisions, as opposed to just being like, oh hey, I'm gonna go from this guy to this guy and not think anything of it because that's just my role in this film. Well, she has that exchange, and she also says um, that she's afraid that Bond is sleeping with her just to get to her husband, but not too afraid to stop. And mm. as she's practically going down on Bond, he says, well, you know anything about ellipsis? And she's just like, now it doesn't seem like the right time for this. <laughs> kind of. Well, no, well no, it basically says, like, um, he says, can I ask you a personal question? And she's basically hovering over his crotch. Right, and just that says now. Now would seem like a an opportune moment to yeah. ask a personal question. It's like she probably she probably said, in, "Do you like Jewish men or something like that?" It's just like, right, yeah, <laughs> not about ellipses, you know. Yeah, and she has no idea, and she she answers the phone because it's her husband. He says, "Should I ask him?" Just like, yeah, this this guy that I'm on the, on top of right now wants to know whether you whether right. you know anything about ellipses. I think you know the guy. I think he's the one that took the car. Like you know, kind of, but um. Bond is kind of still trying to figure things out and everything, and he overhears, uh, and not overhears, so she knows that he, he being Demetrios, was heading to the airport, so Bond knows that he's got to go to the airport to try to meet up with him, and he orders some champagne and caviar just for one, because he's going to go ditch Solange, so Solange doesn't even get to actually sleep with Bond. Yeah, the magic penis is this magic penis is now maybe it's retired at this point pretty much because well no the magic penis hasn't 
gone into effect yet. He hasn't. He doesn't have the magic in the penis yet. That builds over time. Now he's Bond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But once there's magic there, now he's Bond. <laughs> it's just like. Again, I like the change of pace. The idea of Bond would say, "Okay, I'm going to get the old one of the old Bonds would say, okay, 'Okay, I'm going to get that uh, plane and chase down Demetrius in an hour or so,' and then just go back to Salon, Salon for a little while." But this guy's like, "Okay, I've got something to do. I need to deal with this guy, so I'm just getting on the next plane to LA." So now, if you think about it like this, we've seen in the other movies, Bond can sometimes be bitter towards his job. At this point, Bond's fresh, he's excited, he's like, I know, I got a job to do. Whereas, you know, once he's a little more seasoned, he's like, yeah, yeah, the villain can wait. I'm gonna gonna just have some fun with this random woman, and I'll worry about it later. So then, of course, over to the flight to Miami kind of a thing. Um, This whole setup is this museum of these corpses. It's a real thing. They're actual dead bodies, not like props is creepy and bond and demetrius have this silent struggle with this knife where bond's able to stab him and put him with the rest of the corpses in there i think it's missing some kind of a quote uh quip of some sort but yeah whatever i really like the uh the little whole death sequence there that stabbing is something that we haven't really seen in this series yeah, I like the fact that it's like this this silent fight, knife fight, right in the middle of everyone. It's like they're just, they've got the knife so obscured that so people can't see what they're doing, but they're basically just holding each other closer and just trying to get the knife into one of them. And Bond eventually is able to twist it enough that he can get it into Demetrius and kill him. And grab the phone, see the ellipsis message, know that he's in a, he's in a rough situation again. But again, it's more of a case of Bond killing instead of questioning. Yeah, he could have very easily taken him in in some other kind of fashion, but instead, another dead body. So he's hey, got to track down. He's got a to kill and he's, he's using it. So. Yeah, that means he's got to track down some more information. So he swipes his phone, calls up the last person who texted, and he gets to see who to track, which is some good spy work. There's yeah, a... In a spy film, imagine that. There's somebody in the airport metal detector. Yeah, I know. I know it's this one. Guess where we've seen uh, him before. Now I'm just kidding. It's uh, it's, it's Richard no. Branson. Yeah, it's. I mean, so honestly, that might be the the thing that I hate most about this movie is that Richard Branson got to be in a Bond movie. <laughs> and it's like it's very subtle. If you're not looking out for it, you might not notice. But because I, 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 I saw it out of the corner of my eye when I was just because I, again I wasn't paying that much attention, but then I had to rewind it and just like, is that Richard? Oh yeah, it is Richard Branson. Great. Yeah. So I'm sure that that was just the sort of thing where it was like, hey, can I be in the Bond film? All right, we'll put you in there. Uh, the bomber, Carlos, again, doesn't get named in this movie. He uses the ellipsis code to enter a locked security area. I love the exchange where, where Bond calls up Villiers and it's like, you know, tell M to get on the line. Like, I need her on the line right now. She finally gets on and he goes, I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> the one of the things that I do appreciate about it is one not appreciate so much about, but one thing I did notice is that I talked about earlier about Bond doing good spy work by calling in so he can track this guy down. Then he does some pretty bo- poor spy work because this guy notices him from a mile away that he's being watched. And so when he's trying on glasses, he just manages to sneak away and Bond has to chase him down and try and figure out where he's gone. Yeah, he so, does not blend in like a chameleon in this scene for any means. No. So he's still trying to figure this shit out, really, and to be a bit more sneaky rather than just being the blunt object that M describes him as. At least he doesn't put his hand to his ear. No, that's true. So he's learned <laughs> that lesson already. The, he, he's going on the phone and talking to people. I also love the fact that these, these are such... This is 2006. Those phones look like they're ancient. Yeah. Like the, there's no smartphone at all. It's just an actual old cell phone. Yeah. And it just looks like it's a, from a different world almost, even though it's like only 15 years ago. And like a big plot point of this ends up being, or at least a driving point, not a plot point, is a PDA. This is funny. So cue another action sequence, partially a foot chase, partially a car chase. Carlos is going to blow up this new airplane that's launching today, Skyfleet. Same thing that Lashif was selling the stocks on. 
and Bond, of course, wants to stop that from happening, not knowing what the hell is really necessarily going on, but he knows that there's a bomb, so let's stop the bomb. And there's this good stunt of Bond rolling and narrowly avoiding being run over. The, the action itself is great. Thumbs up when it comes to this uh, sequence. Any standout moments out of this before we get to the, the end of it? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the... There, there's something about this Bond in particular with running. In the, he he runs quite a lot in this movie, and he's just the the sprint with the arms like going up and down, like he's a proper sprinter, and he does that so much in this movie. And like he catches onto the back of the tanker early on, and he's able to get a few. Uh, it's uh, before the rolling scene happens. It's because um, Carlos is heading towards this. Um, is heading towards this truck coming in the other direction, and he's trying to essentially ram Bond off of it, and he does the roll across, but he manages to. Get to the other side. Get to the other side and get back onto it because, essentially, um, what, I've, what I did find quite impressive was well, whoever was actually driving this car or this truck managed to do a jackknife with it or a J turn with this fucking oil tanker. It's like, okay, that's a pretty impressive driver that can do that stuff. So, so yeah, that, that's kind of like the main thing that I took away from it. Is just there's a lot of good, a lot of good fighting in the the cockpit that was going on. You have a lot of um. Oh yeah, that was the the big stunt out of all this is the um the car being uh sent the police car being sent flying by the jet. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about that in my notes. Because I think I I think I remember seeing a behind the scenes clip of um because I think I owned this movie on DVD at one point or another. I like seen how they filmed it behind the scenes, and it's just insane with how they would just have a be like towing a car towards it and just send it like these giant fans on the other side and just sending it flying just yeah and i I think that that was a a nice little um addition to it just again it's just action on top of action but it's not it never any point felt like it was too over the top for me so for me i'm trying to think of what standout movies could have been released between Die Another Day and this film, but this film very much taps into the modern style of action films. And in that way, I feel like Craig is excels, and that's what his Bond will be best known for. Like, you could almost think Liam Neeson could have done this kind of a Bond film because it's, it's very much that kind of action. And yeah, I. This was one movie that was never boring. It was constantly keeping me engaged because of the level of action. And then it ends with their scuffle where Bond is able to hook the keychain bomb to Carlos's clothes. So when he triggers the detonator, instead of blowing up the plane, he blows himself up. And Bond just smirks. Yeah, I like that because obviously Bond is left in the truck and he's trying to he manages to turn and ha- like do a handbrake turn to stop it because the brakes have been cut. And so he's able to stop the tanker before it goes into the plane. And then he's immediately arrested because, as far as they know, this is the guy that did it in the first place. So so he's immediately arrested. And you ne- you never get told explicitly until you hear the uh, beeping of the bomb that he's managed to put the key ring onto, the guy, onto Carlos's belt. And then you just hear the beeping of the bomb. Carlos looks down. He sees the bombs on him. And then, uh, fortunately, they don't show the actual clip of him blowing up. But you just see Bond smirking. But I assume Carlos is in a million different places right now. It's a great way to do another instance of Bond amusing himself while getting the job done. <laughs> you know? It's a great action sequence. And... We switch over to the fact that the ramifications from this is that Le Chief lost $101 million of Obano's money because the stock went up instead of down. So God, he, that's enough money to send Dr. Evil into a frenzy. He's fucked. And he's not the only one who's having a bad time because to cover up their tracks and to get back at who they know talked, Solange is killed. Uh, we don't yeah. we don't get Q in this movie, sadly. We just get some random dude that we can assume is from Q Branch, who injects Bond with a tracking chip, 
and that's the closest thing we get to a gadget too, which is disappointing. And I hate this mentality of all or nothing that they adopt with this, where you either have like laser guns and invisible cars, or you have nothing at all. What was wrong with something like the key ring finder from the living daylights? That's not, you know, absurd. So this is one of my, maybe it's to say that bond, you're not ready for the gadgets. Like, okay, we made you double O, but you're not ready for the crazy stuff that will come with being a double O. Well, that would be the case if they did it in the next ones, but there are no gadgets in the Craig films. There's not well, a single. Case, I, I just have to say, you know very well, Tony, that modern society is a very all or nothing mentality. So there you go. Eventually, would they do everything or nothing? But it's like there's not a single good gadget in these fil- four films. So I'm going to spoil something that I'll come back to here and there, but I am thumbs downing the gadget section in every single Craig film because they don't do a damn thing. It's like, well, here's something that we have seen before, but it's not as effective. Uh, how many GPS trackers are we going to get? It's uh, it's not good. Uh, I, I would say that by the time the Craig movies come out, technology has advanced such a significant way that it's kind of hard to come up with a gadget. And it seems like that's that sounds like it's like the opposite, that it should be easier to do that. But actually, the thing that really benefited the previous James Bond movies is that they could almost go into some sort of like weird like future world where, okay, we've managed to put these things onto cars and all that other great stuff. And they decided in this one, well, technology in of itself, like the actual sophistication of the internet and... Um, like computers and other stuff like that is kind of enough to really satiate that side of things where where basically Bond is living in this universe and he's doing that stuff that he's, he's using like the, the, the great revolution of technology in this period of time to his advantage anyway. So he doesn't really need to go super over the top with gadgets. And to be honest, I, again, I, I've liked the gadgets in previous Bond movies, but I I don't think they suit Craig's Bond. I think that it would be a hindrance to his character to have gadgets. I wouldn't want him to have, you know, the crocodile submarine, but to me, like the key ring finder that can explode, the uh, the watch that has a detonator in it, the rebreather from Thunderball, you know, like the, the more simple gadgets. I see no reason why they couldn't have incorporated them in there. They just didn't want to. And it's one of the decisions that I really hate about this franchise that it's been so far. So that's all I'll stay with. when it comes to gadgets, just thumbs down already. Just, you know, that's going to be the same for quantum assault. It's going to be the same for skyfall, et cetera. Um, but I do like this scene outside of that. Because I like that it's just like, well, Solange is dead, and M explains a little bit more about, well, Chief lost his money, so he's going to set up this high-stakes game to try to win it back so that the criminals that he's stolen it from are none the wiser, or they at least are kind of like, well, thanks for getting my money back. And since Bond is the best poker player, despite the fact that she doesn't want this to be the case, he is going to intercept the whole game, and he's going to be bankrolled, and they're going to basically have him try to fuck the game up and get Lashif. So it, it takes this long into the movie to set up Casino Royale, but it doesn't feel like it's taking its time. No, it's all been a really nice build up to this moment. You like you know this is like the centerpiece of the entire movie. That's why it's called Casino Royale in the first place, but they've built up the reasons why Bond like Bond has naturally progressed from finding information from different people and going from source to source to finally be in a situation where he can, they know that Lashif is involved and he's the person to go after and Bond is the person with the skill set for the job. You know, it's funny now that you guys bring that up, maybe that adds to why this is your favorite film, Callum, is because you always talk about liking the story and the build and this movie does have a lot of it because 
I think by now in other films, we would have been further along in the plot. But I do admit I enjoy this type of progression as opposed to the other. Uh, we're about to get to the plot, the part where it becomes my favorite movie of the entire franchise. Oh, already at this point, I know there's going to be number one. By this point in the movie, I know I'm immediately going to put it number one. But the next couple of scenes in particular, but then just from there and then throughout the rest of the movie, just sends it over the top for me. So on the train ride over there, a woman sits down and introduces herself as I'm the money. And he says every penny of it. And some people are like, that's money, Patty. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's Vesper Lind played by Eva Green. And boy, is she attractive. And yeah. I, I mean, will, yeah, I will say yeah. this. We're not obviously ranking the bond girls just on their attractiveness. We're ranking them on the characters themselves, but character plus attractiveness, attractiveness, character separately is she not a number one contender or what she's very much a number one contender in both categories and it's one of those things when you first watch it when you're 13 and you're just like oh wow you know one of those eye-opening moments as Callum was saying Jesus she's beautiful and it's like I don't like the whole I'm the money every penny of it but this whole scene is fantastic. Oh, God. I, 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 can, I could gush for hours just on this scene alone. It's just... It's one of those scenes that I just watch in a movie, and it's, it's very rare that it happens, but I watch it and just go, if you were to do anything else than what you've just done in this scene, you would ruin it. Or you'd make it worse. You can't, like... You could say, oh, maybe we should tweak this one little thing or do this one other camera angle. I just go, no, because if you do that, it makes it worse than what it is. Like they could have done anything, anything different and it would be worse than what they ended up coming coming up with. I think it's it's one of one of those rare examples to me of a perfect scene. Yeah, it's banter and innuendo and great dialogue. She explains that she is from the Treasury. So she's responsible for this kind of the, the money side of the things there. And she asks him if he's given the thought that if he loses, they'll have directly financed terrorism, which is like, yeah, that's a good point. You know, that'll be $150 million or whatever that like just goes into the mix like that. Like, wow. Yeah. What? I just love that mixture. Of that's like, she just says the phrase, like, I suppose you've given support to the notion that if you lose, our government will directly finance te terrorism. And then you just cut to Bond just thinking about that for a second. And then she just immediately picks up the menu and says, well, it's good. Just like, yeah. just like immediately changes the conversation. They go over some of the rules of bluffing and poker and they read each other too. And uh, he calls out that she's basically it's a, she's too pretty to not get in her own way and for other people to judge her based off of that too. And she knows that. So then she gets her in her way about it. You know, she is self-conscious and she's insecure, but that comes off as arrogant because she tries to make up for it. And that just makes people dislike her. And since she had ignored a quip about uh, her parents with her name Vesper, that he's like, well, you know, I would have gone with an only child, but I think you're, you're more of an orphan. And she, you know, quit wit, uh, quick wit, I should say, turns it right back to him, calls him out for a suit, says, oh, you must have gone to Oxford because that's, you know, you think that people dress like that <laughs> and you clearly hate it. So you didn't come from money, which means that you're probably an orphan as well. And you think of women as disposable pleasures. And so, you know, despite my, like, my imagination and everything, I'm not going to be distracted by your perfectly formed ass. And the only way that he can really respond is, you, you noticed. <laughs> and I, I really love it as well, too, where she's like, how was your lamb? And he just goes, skewered. One sympathizes. <laughs> It's so good. It's just like I I I I went so far as to start to look at the the whole script like for volume of this entire thing just because I just had to read it after hearing it, and it's just like it's just so good about how Bond just immediately picks her out and just reads her completely perfectly about 
because it immediately starts like well your beauty's a problem you worry you won't be taken seriously and so she just goes well basically that's the problem that every attractive woman with a brain has yeah and then just uh, but then he just reads her even more like significantly about how she it's like prickly in nature and so she she dresses more masculine masculine clothing and she's more aggressive than her female colleagues and that thinks that she's going to be taken more seriously by her male colleagues but that's going to be intimidating to them and so that means that she'll never progress any further than that talk about the orphan stuff she fires straight back about how he wears the suit because like as you said he's from oxford but he wears it so uh poorly or wears it like with that. such just, disdain is what she says yeah and stuff like that it is that he was also went to orphan like the orphan as well and so meant that you're a school by the grace of someone else's charity and that's why he's got that chip on his shoulder so it's just like he's he's never adjusted to the fact that he was able to go into a, a, a strong education because it was on someone else's dime essentially um, and it makes sense since MI6 looks for mal- maladjusted young men who give little thought to sacrificing others in order to protect Queen and country. It's like, you know, former SAS tights with easy smiles and expensive watches. And she asks him whether he has a Rolex. He says, Omega. Immediately. Yeah, afterwards. she thinks it's a Rolex and he's oh, Omega. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, Close enough, but, kind of thing. Yeah, but it's, it's just um, so good. And, and then you just build up the idea of the fact that she's going to be. I guess a tough nut to crack almost for Bond because the idea that she knows that he treats women as disposable pleasures, as you said, and that means that she's going to just keep her mind on the money. She's not going to get involved and stay away from his perfectly formed ass. Just, just love the way that she says it as well, because then it just sets the undercurrents like she knows he's attractive. He knows that she's attractive, but she's given a perfectly valid reason about why she doesn't want to proceed with any sort of like entanglement. Right. It's perfect. It's an amazing scene. Absolutely fantastic scene. And they have another great scene after it, too, in the car. In the car, it's so good. They're going over their paperwork, and he says, well, it seems like my alias is Arlington Beach, and yours is Stephanie Broadchest. (laughs) Oh, you're going to have to trust me on this one. (laughs) You're just going to have to trust me on this one. And then it's just, again, again, it's another good reason of going about it, because they talk about how they're posing as a couple, but then Lynn brings up the idea that she's a strict Roman Catholic, and that means they're going to have a two-bedroom suite rather than... Like a double room, and then he's just goes, "I hate it when religion comes between us." Yeah. Just... <laughs> he also says, "Don't worry, you're not my type." And she goes, "Oh, smart." And he goes, "No, single." <laughs> yeah. And they've established that earlier with the fact that he uh, Solange. Uh, well, he was he, he um at least seduced and then uh, abandoned and eventually had killed a married woman. Yeah, it's a it's a great exchange with that, and um, right afterward. Bond flat out checks in as James Bond <laughs> calls out Vesper for being part of the treasury. You know, Do you want to sign? You You know, you represent the treasury or whatever. And she's pissed. She, she is, so is pissed. rightfully pissed because she's just like, well, you know what? Like, what the hell? And he goes, hey, if Lushiv is that connected, he knows who I am. He knows what we're doing here. And that means something. That means that he decided to play anyway. So he's desperate. And she calls out, rightfully so. Yeah, well, you know, now he knows that you are reckless. And she says the line that uh, Cal had mentioned earlier, you know, uh, the elevator doesn't have enough room for both of them and his ego. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, it's great. It's just the dialogue in this movie is so good in in most places. I'm not going to say it's perfect all the way through, but in certain places, it's just it's some of the best dialogue in the entire franchise so far. Yeah, very easily. So it's another good introduction to the Vesper character. It shows that she has legitimate agency to her, not just being a part of like, you know, the agent side of things, but like she, she's not an idiot. She's not the, oh, I'm not an idiot, but I'm an idiot types of tropes that we've seen before. Like uh, Stacey Sutton, for instance, who it was like, you know, well, she's smart enough that she could be the geologist, but also she's a complete moron in most of the other scenes and everything. So that's, Always disappointing when that kind of stuff happens, but not the same when it comes to Vesper. And Bond then meets up with his contact. That's going to be one of our main allies for this. Renee Mathis, who has set up the chief of police <laughs> just to make it a little bit easier. You know, just ah, I didn't want to bribe him or whatever. I figured it'd be easier to just Photoshop some other stuff and whatever. Well, but he, he gives the impression that he's crooked anyway. Yeah, and so you get the you get the sense because he's in he says he's good friends with Lashifa anyway, 
And so they decide, okay, well, he's crooked anyway. And we decide to use an opportunity to just have him, like his deputy, to come across some documents that incriminate him. And so that's a good. You show that Mattis is someone who isn't above doing some dirty work to get what he needs to do. And that's kind of a theme that runs for, I say that, I would say the rest of the movie, but at least it builds some sort of suspicion around him as well. I also want to talk about the fact that we're introduced to the Aston Martin DBS as well. This so, is true. Uh, and that is such a beautiful car. So that chief of police, guess where we've seen it before. Oh my God. Um, I'm, trying to rem- I'm trying to remember him because like, he was bald and he had this prominent moustache. So I, I assume he didn't look like that in a previous Bond movie. And I'm almost feeling like at this point you're almost trying to trick us and bang us into saying that he's from a Bond movie when you're just saying, ah, he's just from this instead. Because that's totally you. <laughs> <laughs> but I assume he was from a Bond movie. I'm going to guess that he was from, and they seem to be going from the older ones right now, so I'm going to say he was from Diamonds of Forever. Uh, I will say that he is from For Your Eyes Only. So you're kind of right. That Come is what? that is the producer. Which Mike, one? That is the producer, Michael G. Wilson, the one that has cameos in like all these movies. Oh, it is. Oh. Hey, cool. Yeah, yeah, so he gets to uh to be in that kind of part, which is fun. Um that quick though, we already like Mathis. Just like when he pops the the little bit of food in his mouth and he's just like, I think that your odds are improving and stuff. It's like all right, Mathis is cool. He's we'll very charismatic. Him. He's great. Absolutely love that guy. Uh, Bond and Vesper have it back and forth. He gives her a dress. And she's like, you know, do you expect me to wear this? Whatever. And she's, he says, well, I want you to look fantastic and distract people at the table. He goes yeah. into his room and notices there's a tailored suit <laughs> there. <laughs> she's totally guessed his measurements, as she says. You know, she eyed him up and uh, sized him up, as she says, the moment that she saw him. Yeah, again, it's just another great thing. It's just this. I, I had to write down the line verbatim here. I think, or I don't, I don't know if I got it strictly the same, but it, it was basically say, "I need you looking fabulous." So when you come by and kiss me on the neck, the other players will be focusing on your neckline and not on their cards. I think that's a, again, he's using her, and he says basically, "Can you manage that?" And she says, "Yeah, just about fine." And she's annoyed about it. And then he sees the suit, and like he gets annoyed about the fact that he's already got a dinner jacket, and so he doesn't need another one. And so Vesper says that she needs him looking like a man that belongs at the table. And I just love the way that he says it's tailored, like that sort of thing. Just like that's the thing that's really perplexed him about the entire thing. Oh, it's so good. These two, these two have got such amazing chemistry. Yeah, there's dinner jackets and dinner jackets, and that one's the latter. <laughs> Is this the best chemistry between Bond and a Bond girl? I say 100% yes. If you're not counting uh, Judy Dench as a Bond girl, then yes. Yeah. Fair Very enough. Much. Uh, I would agree with that. So that takes us into another part here. He's trying it on in the mirror. That's another point where now he's James Bond. <laughs> Uh, I also just have a note that says, God damn, is Eva Green attractive? <laughs> just, I don't know. I guess it's just in there. Um, yeah, she is. Like That's like one of the, the on-running themes. She yeah. is incredibly attractive. Yeah, she is. Um, I also have a note that says, Monsieur Mendel is awesome. <laughs> he's the one that explains the rules. Uh, he's this great little dopey, happy, supporting character. This, like this, this funny little Swiss banker. Yeah, it's just like, ha, 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 like all the time. <laughs> like, I love this guy. Um, so the names of our players for this game will be Bond. Where's it Beach? I'm confused. Uh, Le Chief. And here's a bunch of names that we, we don't really know. Some of them they, they say, but not most of them. One of them being Fukutu. My absolute favorite out of them. Uh, Infante or Infante. I'm not too sure. I think it's Infante. There's Tumeli. Gallardo, Kamenovsky, Grafin van Wallenstein, which might be like Grafin van Wallenstein or something like that. I don't know exactly how to do some terrible accent when it comes to that, I'm sure. And Madame Wu that I mentioned earlier. And well, the other guy, he's played by Jeffrey Wright. We'll come back to him. 
those are our people that are going to be playing at Casino Royale. And of course, they're all CD characters. We know that they're up to something, whatever. But Bond notices that the tell for the chief is his twitching eyeball. I meant just quickly because it, it comes up later in the movie is that Bond has to put a password into the descript into the decryption machine, which will unlock the winnings at the end of it. So yeah, we don't know. He doesn't. We he doesn't inform us of what his password is, but he puts a password in, and that will come up later in the movie. I love how Mickelson. I don't know how he does this, but how he shuffles the chips in his fingers. I think it's so cool. He he's just it amazes me just how because he, he's an awesome actor and that for most people would just be enough but is the fact that he the stuff that he does in hannibal it's like all the cooking that he does is just like how much do how much is he willing to learn and how much is he willing to like build up traits to just add more depth to the characters that he's playing just like that that's why i just think he's so incredible and just the thing where he's like flicking the uh, chips around where he's constantly staring at his cards. He just looks like how you'd imagine a professional poker player would look in this environment. Those little touches make a big, big difference because those get you to where you're focused on something like that and you're not necessarily focused on thinking about how long it's been since we've had an action sequence or something, you know? Because I'm sure some people are like, oh, get another explosion or something. I I've a pre I really appreciate the change of pace that this uh, casino scene provides. Just a, it's just a nice different environment. But there's still so much tension in the air. So Bond orders a very specific drink: dry martini, three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kinalale, shake it over ice, add a thin slice of lemon peel, and then everybody else just kind of one by one goes like, oh, I'll have one of those. Oh, I'll have one of those. I'll have one of those. Jeffrey Wright's character wants one too, but he says, but hold the fruit. So he's got a little bit more like flair to him, which is pretty, pretty cool. I've never had this drink. I'm not a drinker. I don't like the taste of alcohol at all in any form, but at some point I'm going to have this exact drink just to go like, Oh my God, this is terrible. Or something. <laughs> Pull a reaction. Yeah, like a way uh, to celebrate the wedding. Maybe that's where I'll have it. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that. Get the same reaction that uh, Pam Bouvier has, you know? I love the fact that, like, they, they're they ordering this drink and the chef gets so annoyed about it. Yeah, he's so great. He's just like, are you done? Can we play poker now? <laughs> just kidding. And, but of I, course, I actually, Bond, just to be a dick, even more goes, wait, excuse me? <laughs> just wait. <waste. laughs> well, yeah, just you get, you get the impression that he is, um, he's doing it to, um, He's obviously doing it to get under his skin and to throw him off his game. So that's yeah. good. Oh, we also haven't mentioned about the fact that during this one-on-one -on -one that Bond had with the chief where he finds out the tell mm -hmm. is that this is when Vesper arrives in the purple dress. And she just looks you know, amazing. So she pulls well, that off. Because I love it. It's just the fact that she, uh, the only thing that happens is that the only person that she distracts at the table yeah. realistically is Bond. <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and that's because Bond goes up to her because he kisses her when he gets to the bar just to, again, try and uh, distract them a little bit. But um, he says the line, you're supposed to enter from the the other side of the room. He says, oh, was I? Just like that sort of, again, she's be, they're being dangerously flirtatious with each other. To a point where, obviously, that does kind of distract everything or whatever, but um, they also have this whole thing uh, going on. <laughs> Uh, she says, this is me in character pissed off at you for losing. Oddly, my character's feelings mirror my own. <laughs> Fantastic. I, God, she looked good. I wish I could say, like, something other than, duh, pretty girl, but like, wow, she looked good. And um, a little bit later on, Bond slips a bug inside of the inhaler, which I don't think it would work like that but you know whatever that's it's a movie well, that's a gadget that's that's not not a gadget, that's a gadget. gadget. it's a gadget i count gadget a bug like uh ah, i'll allow it that's a gadget that's so like uh well this is gonna gadget you know in some ways yeah some of them they are yeah 
Oh, is, we won't is get to. Is it, is it something that a normal agent would have? Oh, maybe, maybe not. One that's the size that fits into an inhaler. I think that's a gadget. It's a weak gadget at, at the very best. <laughs> But we get that whole sequence that's going to play into factor a little bit later on, of course, not too long right after this, because uh, Bonds, you know, I mean, obviously puts the bug in there for a reason. So he's wants to try to listen in. And that leads to a different sequence here. Uh, they break after an hour long intermission. Uh, they break for an hour long intermission, I should say, after playing for four hours. That's a detail that we're going to come back to. Bond pretends that Vesper desperately wants him to go back to the hotel room to have sex. <laughs> Pretends, yes. He's just like, yeah, you just said that you wanted to go back to the hotel room. Like, that's how we're going to excuse ourselves. And Lashif goes back to his hotel room. Valenka kisses him, says she's sorry. And hey, Obana's here and he wants his money. Rightfully so, because it's a hundred fucking million dollars. And he lost it. Uh, Obano threatens to cut off Valenka's arm, but he doesn't. Funny enough, he points out that Lashif didn't even bother to protest it. Like, just no, hey, don't do that. Like, no, oh, stop that. Don't whatever. He's just like, wow, he did not say a damn thing. You might want to find a new boyfriend, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that kind of weakens the fact that she does just help him afterwards throughout the thing. But yeah, it just it, it's showing his cowardice to a degree which is something that a bond villain probably should have to in in his core to an extent yeah but brutal brutal scene and yeah it's one of those things that really adds to the just disgust of a bond villain yeah, and, and considering like the way that the film has been shot so far you would not have been surprised if he had cut his, her arm off Right, and like just some kind of quick cut away from it where they don't show the arm actually get cut off, but it's like, okay, that happened. And, and then it could be like, you know, that's your lesson. You, you need to get me the money back immediately kind of a thing or something. Or she could have just been like flat out killed, you know, like uh, we're going to threaten to cut her arm off, but we're not going to. Instead, we just shoot her. Something like that. That's happened in other movies. But Bond is trying to check this out and... She, uh, he and Vesper are spotted, uh, particularly Obano notices that Bond's wearing an earpiece. So that kind of, you know, foils the plot a little bit and it results in his awesome fight in the stairwell. Obano's wielding a machete. Vesper's trying to get away. It's all tightly quartered, you know, kind of like the thing from, from Russia with love and some other train sequences we've had. And Bond eventually strangles Obano to death while Vesper watches on in horror. Yeah, so she so she was also kind of like involved in that part because um, a banner's going for the gun, and so she grabs it away from him. She knocks it down. The gun goes off at one point, but it doesn't hit anybody. But it's just like she's just making sure that he can't get to the gun to deal with him, and then she just has to watch as Bond uh, chokes this guy and suffocates him. And so yeah, she's horrified by it. Bond is bloodied all over the place he has to go back to his hotel room he has to you see this extended like couple of like minute long shot of him essentially trying to deal with all the blood on his face and on his arms he drinks to just try and numb the pain for a little while just it's one of those things where you just see how it's almost like it's, it's one of those things you just wouldn't see in the old bond movies and that even after bond has had a fight with someone he always just kind of just dusts himself off and moves on immediately into whatever the next scene is Whereas this one is just like Bond has to just take a moment to compose himself and deal with his cuts and bruises before he gets back into the game. And like most of the Bond films before, he would have just been like, you know, some kind of a quip about the stairwell. Like, uh, you know, he was two steps away from surviving that one or, you know, like one of those kind of things. But instead, it's just go find Mathis. I've hid the bodies down here. Go, go, go find him. Let me drink some booze, wipe off my blood, and clean up my wounds. Yeah, it's another one of those things where, again, you wonder, is he just more of a sociopath in the beginning, or is he so dedicated to the job? Or is it like you get so burnt out and bitter that you start going, ha, I'm going to make a clip about how I threw this guy down the stairs because I hate my job and I hate my life. 
just like and, desensitized yeah kind of thing yeah and of course uh he takes care of all that stuff and Lashif just says hey you changed your shirt is this game making you sweat and bond being bond says like yeah maybe i'm sweating a little bit but i'm not gonna really think that i'm in trouble until i start weeping blood it's <laughs> just kind of like yeah. <laughs> great the chief just smirks yep that, uh, that works for me again just two guys they know they kind of know they're in a game with themselves really at this point and so they're just taking shots at each other wherever they can and we can assume four hours later based off of what they said earlier we've been playing for four hours let's take a break might not be but you know based off of that little plot point you can assume that four hours later bond goes back to his room and he sees a broken wine glass here's that the shower's still running so that's like uh uh-oh but it turns out that vesper is just in the shower still wearing her dress sitting on the floor traumatized by what she's watched she's shaking she was supposed to be in the scene in her underwear but daniel craig pointed out rightfully so he's like if she was so traumatized why would she stop to remove her clothes it's like you know what good point and it is an even better visual with her having not taken off the dress yeah, it works perfectly. You just you get the sense of like just seeing her visibly shaking in this as we find out cold shower. And it's just Yeah, it's just it's a harrowing scene just seeing like the actual consequences of this stuff. Because again, it's just something you don't see in the other Bond movies that yeah. these people that involved like these major shootouts and stuff like that, and they just kind of have to brush it off. And you can kind of say that it's an element of strength, but it's almost like it's more real to see this woman who, as far as we're concerned throughout the course of the movie so far, is just completely removed from this type of thing. She's a banker, pretty much. And she got involved in this this entire thing, saw, saw a guy die in front of her, almost saw Bond get killed by a fucking machete. And yeah, she's traumatized by it. And it's like it's completely removed from the old Bond approach to things. And again, it's a great train of pace for that. It's one of those things that you don't realize until you see a scene like this, that, yeah, all of the past characters really shake this stuff off quickly, and they don't seem to have any effects of everything that they see and live through. I made the joke before about thank God we're alive sex, but really, like, they don't react to it at all. So to see this, it adds another one of those vulnerable human elements to this movie and bond gets in there with her she says uh it feels like that there's blood on her hands that won't come off because she you know she partially contributed towards obano's death she obviously she had to but he decides the best way to help is to suck on her fingers i know it's supposed to be sweet but it's just fucking weird to me (laughs) Yeah, I thought that was a little bit, that was going a little bit far. Like, she, he could have just, like, kissed her hand. And then that's yeah. A little bit more. Yeah. That's a, that's a little bit weird. Like, maybe it's just the idea that he's just trying to get, like, because essentially saying that she feels like she can't wash the blood off her hands. And maybe he feels like, oh, suck the blood off instead, the fake blood off instead. <laughs> and then maybe that's, like, make her feel better. But, yeah, it's just, maybe it's just the idea that Bond doesn't know how to deal with these sort of situations. It just kind of, I don't know. To me, if I were on the set, I'd be like, mm, let's do another take with something else. Like, maybe yeah. this is uh, Barbara Rockley's fantasy or something like that. I don't know. I mean, it's a good I, job she wasn't dead because Brosnan probably would have pumped her or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Vesper's theme, by the way. Uh, it's, it's a variation of the love theme motif that we've gotten before, but it takes it to a whole new level. It's pretty much Paris Carver's theme with a twist. And it's so good. So do yourself a favor. Listen to this theme that plays during the scene and another one of them later on in the movie, which we'll get to. Next morning, I love how Mathis does this. He's hidden the bodies in a trunk of a car and he calls one of the cell phones so that the cops immediately see it. 
And he's just like, oh, being dead doesn't mean that you still uh, can't be helpful. How good as math is. Love this dude. It's so, great. He's like he's crooked, but he's a likable crooked guy. He's like the the next best version of Karimbe. I, I can buy that. My, yeah, I don't know that. Mathis asks Bond, uh, "Did Vesper melt your cold hard yet?" No answer. Just yeah, you know, move on from that kind of thing. Back at the card game, a few people are out. Vesper's wearing another fucking knockout dress here. If you're wondering how to top Zenya's look from the casino scene of Goldeneye, here's your answer. Uh, Mathis points out to Vesper not only how good-looking she is and whatever, but um, earlier in the movie. Uh, he also says that Lashif's tell is about his eyeball. Bond thinks so, too. And Lashif goes all in, so Bond matches him naturally. He's got a full house, pretty damn good. But Lashif has four jacks and wins. He knows that Bond knows his tell, and he played it perfectly. So Bond's just left immobile, staring at the table. Fuck. He lost. Again, it's a nice change of things because nothing nothing phases bond in old movies for the most part like every now and again he might lose every he might lose or be a bit shaken up by the villain beating him up or something like that and he loses his step a little bit but this is where you just feel like bond is like he is fucked up badly and you just don't get that sense in previous movies and it's again you just feel like okay bond's in a real tight situation here how's he going to deal with it and then the next scene really just makes the situation, compounds the situation even further. And it's one of those things where after watching 20 films, it's kind of like, to use a wrestling analogy, it's like watching Hogan finally lose. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, they are human, they can lose. And I think Bond was overdue for a loss. Especially in something like the casino games. Like, he's always just in control. And in this one, the guy literally plays the fact of you thought that you were in control and you're not. So that's a great little moment thing there. And uh, after that whole, you know, him staring at the table and everything like that, Bond is wanting to get back in. So he just tells Vesper, well, you know, I'm going to have to use that other five million dollars to, to rebuy in. And she says, no. Your ego is why you lost, and that's why you want to buy in again. You don't actually want to get this job done. You just want to prove that you can beat him, and you're just going to lose more money. She's right. Yeah, it's this again. It's more. It's a more verbal argument between two of them. It's it's probably the most serious it's gotten so far as him saying that he's calling her an idiot because essentially, if he doesn't go back in, then Lashif wins and. This whole terrorism, global terrorism, gets funded anyway. Um, but she's saying, well, if you go in, he's just going to get another $5 million because you're just being completely reckless and you're not thinking clearly. And so they, they both have valid points, and that's why they're such loggerheads. But I, and I love Bond's reaction to this because he's now told that he's not getting this $5 million to buy back in. So he's essentially he's done on the poker table. He can't. So his only response is to think with his hot-headedness, which yeah. is, I'm going to grab a knife, and I'm going to kill this fucker. Yeah, he is seething at this point. Mm. He even, he heard a vodka martini, the bartender says, shaking her stirred, and he says, do I look like I give a damn? So it's like, again, ha, ah, we didn't do the thing, kind of a thing, which is like, all right. Sometimes it's a series kind of, pisses me off when it does that because it's like look at us we're smarter than the thing and i'm like no come on but it works here and yeah he grabs the knife and he, after he starts going after the chief he gets stopped by jeffrey wright's character who says hey i should have introduced myself earlier seeing as how we're related i'm your brother from langley felix lighter Woo! yeah one of the characters that should have come back in previous films, since they didn't kill him off in License to Kill. But this is cool. I popped. 
Did you yeah, know that he was bad. Felix uh, going into it, Rob? Um, no, because I hadn't seen it in a while, but yeah, I didn't know. Did you remember it, Callum? Um, I didn't know. I can't remember what his character's name was. I knew he was CIA agent. I didn't remember. I didn't recall the name Felix Leiter. That was one of those things. I knew going into the movie that he was Felix just because it had been announced. Like he had been cast as Felix Leiter. But I was just like, oh, man, I'm so glad that Felix is back. I'm a big fan of Jeffrey Wright in the role. He's not my favorite, absolute favorite, because that's um, David Hedison from License to Kill. But he is a very, very close second. Because his Felix is kind of like, I can see this dude being a badass, you know? Yeah, he looks um he looks intimidating, but he also knows that this isn't his scene. Yeah. He so says, he's uh, there. I'm bleeding chips. Bond's a better player. Uh, you know, how about I stake you? And the condition being the CIA gets to take in Lashif. Bond's cool with it. And uh, I like the Bond says, well, what about the winnings? And Felix says, well, does it look like we need the money? <laughs> It's just a cool little like ah, that's how they meet, sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah it, it it does like sew the scene for like a, a friendship going forward because he helps him out and yeah, yeah, it's it's like he helps him out of this really sticky situation that he's got himself into, and Bond pretty much decides pretty much repays him by his performance going forward. He's like, I'm gonna remember this if a shark ever bites off you. <laughs> It'd be great if there's uh, some kind of reference to that. Yeah. I promise that I won't kiss your wife too much on your wedding. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I should have introduced myself since we're related. I'm your brother from Langley. Also, I'm pretty sure you fucked my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, Lashif gets caught doing his tell. So he folds. Uh, and we get to see that Valenka, who still has both her arms, mind you. Poisons Bond's uh, martini as Vesper just leers on that Bond's in the game. Just like, mm, this isn't what I fucking want. You're going to screw up, all that stuff. Almost immediately, Bond knows that something's wrong with the drink. And he goes to the bathroom, gets some salt water to try to make himself throw up. Stumbles around, goes to his car to get his med kit where he rings up with a MI6. And they said, you're going to be dead in two minutes if you don't follow these instructions directly exactly as we're saying it because you're going to have to defibrillate yourself your heart's going to stop but you need to keep your heart basically kind of going and you know inject this one thing and put this in your neck do this with that but there's a wire loose and bond can't do it so he dies (laughs) 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 so what'd you guys think of the film uh, yeah, but it was really good. To be fair, yeah. it's like top film. Yeah, I'm glad he's good. I'm glad he's dead. Fucking nice. Yeah. <laughs> so this med kit. Guess where we've seen it before? Now nah, I'm fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, Vesper gets there just to see flat lines, shocks him back to life, and I love the, the moment in this where he's totally bewildered because I mean, shit, he died and came mm-hmm. back, and he just goes. Are you okay? <laughs> to Vesper? <laughs> Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You only live twice. And now yeah. he's Bond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I just, Felix. Like that. Get, Go ahead. I, I just love the fact that afterwards, because this whole scene is really well shot as well, because he's just like stumbling. The amount of sweat he's just protru- like producing is just incredible. Like, I, don't, I don't know how many times they had to like wet him up for this scene constantly and it's just like him sitting it there and they said like you have to follow these instructions exactly he says he's just laughing saying i'm always it's like that's this that's that's daniel craig's bond that's his humor and i just love it i do enjoy the fact that they said and don't interrupt like we're gonna cut you off here do not interrupt us with your quips and your bullshit because you will die right like they know him just well enough that they're just kind of like bond fuck it knock it off (laughs) you know like um, Felix is out of the game. Bond comes back in and says, oh, "I'm sorry, I had to excuse myself. That last hand nearly killed me." Great. 
I know I prefer, I prefer the uh, that that line is great, but I prefer the previous one. It's like when um he's getting back dressed after being in the car and like he's just been defibrillated. He says, "You're not seriously going back in there? I wouldn't dream of it." And then he just walks back in. <laughs> just great. So eventually, we are down to our last four players: Bond, Le Chief, Fukutu, and Infante. Obviously, we know the latter two aren't going to win, but I'm glad that they're still there because normal movies, the stereotype, uh, stereotype. Wow. Wow. That's the trope and the stereotype mixed in together. The stereotype would be just keep the main two characters because we know that those are the only two that you're interested in. But they skip that obligatory trope or stereotype. And you've got two extra people in there. So it's just kind of like, all right, well, that's cool. I like that. It's a nice little touch. And, uh, I, I, have, I have one little foible with this thing. Is the, So they all start going like all in. And then uh, Mattis turns to Vesper and says, 150 million in the pot. And it can't be 150 million in the pot. Because Bond hasn't used his 5 million buy-in. He used, he used, um, used uh, Felix's. Felix's, so it should be 145. Yeah. That's true. So the maths... The maths is all wrong. You need to get Scott Steiner on the case here. <laughs> so everybody goes all in. And Fukutu has a flush. Infante has a full house. Le Chief has a higher full house. And Bond has two Joker cards. <laughs> it's a straight flush, and he wins. Tips the dealer, I think it's 500 grand. Which, like, it's not his money. <laughs> so it's like... Yeah. When but, you, when, you said, like, the t- when you said the two jokers thing, my mind immediately turned to that um, um, Simpsons. Futurama special where Bender has five kings because one of them's the um, the uh, the king of beers coaster. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were talking about the the Bond reference in uh, the Simpsons where it's um, Homer deals the card and he's like Joker card. What the hell is this? And he's like, oh, sorry. And he hands him another one. And he goes. What is this? Rules for drilling, uh, for dealing uh, poker or whatever. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't lose. I never lose. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bond and Vesper decide, eh, let's get something to eat. You know, Felix is going to go take care of Flashif. So we get another flirtation scene. And he says he wants to call the drink of Vesper because once you've had it, you don't want anything else. Even though she thinks that it's because of the bitter aftertaste. And he points out that her necklace is an Algerian love knot that somebody special uh, gave to her. So, of course, that gets you in that kind of like, ah, oh, okay, she might be like married or at least have like a boyfriend or something that like, you know, that's going to kind of get in the way there. She doesn't really dive too much uh, deeply into it, though, because she turns the tables a little bit. She says that she's concerned that Bond can just switch things off. Killing people is just nothing, right? But he can choose another path in his life if he wanted to. And something to think about in the future. She heads off to go meet with Mathis. And after a couple seconds, Bond just realizes, oh, shit, Mathis. He's the one that leaked about the tell. Cue a car chase. That doesn't really go on as like a car chase. (laughs) So I, I think I may switch off a second. Did you mention the drink? About that he says that it's a Vesper? Yeah, the, yeah, the fact that it's called a Vesper. Yeah. yeah. So I assume you did, yeah. But it's just a, I just like the fact that he has named it in that regards as well. Just Which, like the fact that he's like, he just created like this. He he sat there at that table in that high stakes poker thing and he came up with a drink off the top of his head. Just like, he just, just came up with a lot of ingredients. It turns out it's nice and he's just saying, okay, I'm going to call it a Vesper from now on. And this is yeah. the only thing that I'll drink. Which is like, I mean, in previous movies, vodka martini, shake it, not stirred. Never with the whole, like, three measures of Gordon's, you know, like that kind of thing. But, you know, mm. that's, we're giving a, its own little twist here. Yeah. With a slice of lemon peel. Yeah. So we don't really get the car chase. We just see scenes of Bond just going down this road in the DBS. And then you see Vesper tied up like the damsel in distress in the middle of the road. And Bond has to quickly swerve the car. And it does this massive flipping over scene. Which is cool. Uh, that whole car flip thing broke the world record for barrel rolls assisted by a cannon. They, barrel roll. they destroyed three Aston Martin DB5s in the process, each one oh. of them valued at $300,000. Oh, 
it's, it's so unfair. That so, car is just like those cars are works of art, and it's just it's horrible that they had, that they got lost in this thing. A million dollars to do the flip. I hope it was worth it. Cool flip though, yeah. Could have given those free cars to charity. Presumably me, I'm a charity. <laughs> Could have given a million dollars to charity. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take the yeah, I'll take the three hundred I can't drive anyway, so it's just <laughs> I am also a charity case and would take the car in the money. Uh there you go. See so you did three cars at three hundred thousand apiece. Give us all three hundred thousand. I'll take the cars. I'll take the cars, yeah, too. Yeah. If if anyone listening uh, can afford uh, free Aston Martin DBS is uh, donate to the Patreon. Yeah, right. there's <laughs> there's no specific Aston Martin DBS uh, DB nine uh tier. For the Patreon, but there is the uh the whatever kind of tier. So, <laughs> oh, she also says a very important line. I'm afraid your friend Mathis is really my friend Mathis, and Bond and Vesper are captured, and that brings us to a very unnerving scene. Bottom of a chair is cut out. Bond's tied to it, <sighs> naked, with yeah. Lashif threatening to torture him in the most obvious and simple way. Taking a rope with a knot at the end of it, hitting Bond in the testicles. <laughs> there is not a single guy that has seen this movie that doesn't go, oh, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Just kind of, no, don't do that. Don't do that. This, um, I mean, obviously they got the torture kick from the previous movie in the franchise, and now they're all in on this stuff because spying isn't all glamorous. You kind of sometimes have to end up in these situations. I mean, you look at, like, the world's not enough. Electra is straddling Bond in this torture chair. He's making a joke about one more screw. And then you get a thing like this, where it's just like, now I'm going to hit you in the balls. <laughs> and it, infinitely more threatening. Yeah. I just, I just love it as well, because obviously Le Chiffre is the one doing it. So it's just those two in the room. They've taken Vesper away. And so no idea what's going to happen to her. But then you just see like how much he's uh, like um, Le Chiffre is sweating as well, because he knows he's fucked if he doesn't get the information out of Bond here. Like he's as desperate. He's, he's a desperate man right now. So he couldn't win it in the card game. So he has to resort to something which is a lot cruder. But I love the fact that he talks about how. People get super elaborate with torture devices. I know the simple way of doing it, which is essentially I'm going to hit you in the testicles until you tell me what the <laughs> tell me what the code is to this. And also he mentions it's not just the pain of that. It's the emotional and the mental damage of knowing you have a finite amount of time since this can happen before your junk is. Well, junk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's just kind of like, like, you know, after a while. You're not going to have any balls anymore. Uh, that's Which, it just, you got a, it, a certain amount of times I can hit you with the balls here, and then you're gonna be as he says, like there'll be little left to identify you as a man. Just the fact that this is this is the origin story of the magic penis. It kind of is because uh, <laughs> it's like, like why would Bond not knock anybody up about this? Up oh, because he's probably sterile. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe that is that element too, but. I but just also love... just like use it because you still got it. Because I, cause I just love it because he, he hits him a couple of times and then he's asking about the code and then Bond just says, just this is so good. Just so so Daniel Craig, James Bond. So like, I've got a little itch down there. Would you mind? Yeah, totally obstinate. And he just goes, no, no, to the right. <laughs> yeah, and he just hits him super hard and Bond's screaming in agony throughout this entire thing. And he just like, now, now the whole world is going to know that you died scratching my balls. Yeah, he's a it's complete so psychopath. <laughs> yeah, because he's, yeah, he's just like, like she was saying, like, I die, I die doing this. He's just like, yeah, because I'm not going to tell you anything. And like the CIA is, or these pe uh, the people that you took the money from are going to cut you up in small pieces. And so, so he knows that this guy's, he's dead if he doesn't get the code from Bond. And then you hear Vesper screaming in the background. And then he kind of like, it's a brainwave full of sheep for both face saying, okay, if I can't injure you into telling, then I'm going to use the person that you care about. He also points there. out, though, MI6 would probably still welcome him with open arms. Mm. And he says, oh, yeah, the big picture. 
he realizes something that he wasn't considering with Malaka. He's just like, yeah, you know what? It isn't an ego type of a thing about that. If I die and Vesper dies, Lashif probably will get welcomed with open arms by a max six because we're expendable. Mm. And just before Lashif is able to cut off Bond's balls, Mr. White shows up, says money's not as valuable to the organization as knowing who to trust, and blam! Gunshot to the head. The main villain of the film is killed with a uh, half hour left. Yeah, it's an interesting take because, and I, I kind of, it's part of the reason why I almost felt of pushing Lashifa down because Lashifa isn't really, he is the main villain, but he's not because the entire movie he's under the thumb of another organization pretty much. And, but then I realized, well, some of the other main villains that we kind of herald throughout the entire movie, like Rosa Klebb yep. and Largo and people like that are people that are essentially working, are just hench like major henchmen for the big bad of the uh, Blofeld. And so the Shifa can easily fit into that category and still be a great villain in his own right. But I feel, but it was interesting to just have that guy die, not even by Bond's hand. Yeah. But he did that scratching his balls, essentially. <laughs> yeah, he's right. So then that means that nobody really knows that except for Mr. White and Bond. <laughs> So Bond just goes like around that. perpetually telling people, you know how that guy died? <laughs> I just like that Bond probably intercepted uh, his tombstone when it was made, and it's just like the inscription is, died scratching James Bond's ball. <laughs> also, Cal and I apologize for being dumb, but Tony, Mr. White is not as fun as saying, Mr. Black. <laughs> Mr. Black. <laughs> Nor is it Harvey Keitel from Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> Cut to Bond in a wheelchair, recovering after having some hallucinations of Mathis and Vesper and everybody, and he's talking to Mathis. But Mathis is asking some suspicious questions, and he gives Bond a drink and says, I'm supposed to get you to drink this, and it's just kind of... Hmm. So some agents come, and they tase Mathis and take him away. And it's kind of just like, all right, well, you know, we got the guy that was kind of growing us over so later still bond is with vesper who tells him that every time that he wakes up he looks at her in a way that makes her feel reborn and he says if you've just been born wouldn't you be naked <laughs> uh, uh, i like it i like it i i don't because it's like well because then you're a, a baby and it's uh I got a feeling the same person who did that's the same one who's like, I don't know, he could suck her fingers off the blood and all, you know, uh, no, I, no, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. <laughs> it's fine. I, th I think it's, I think I can kind of just comp compartmentalize that and just feel like I just want to see her naked. Well, it works because she says, uh, you have me there. You could have me anywhere. And she's definitely falling for him. Even more so once Mendel pops up and he's giggling about, you know, not bringing chocolates and all. And he asks Bond to put the password in. And the password is not at all what he typed. If you watch the scene where he types in the password, he does not type out the combination of words that would end up being V-E-S-P-E-R. But yeah, he, he definitely doesn't. Yeah. It's a bit of a continuity area. Totally a continuity area. It's, it's Vesper. That's the, the thing. And she is totally distraught about this, about everything that's going on and about some more stuff that we learned about a little bit later on. But she says to Bond, you know, if all that was left of you was your smile and your little finger, you'd still be more of a man than anyone I've ever met. Because obviously, of course, you know, he's in there because his balls got fucked up. Like, you know, it's a thing. And he, he says, well, that's because you know what I can do with my little finger. She says, no, I don't. He goes, oh, well, you're dying to find out. Now, that exchange, I like. I, I think that low-key line about the little finger is is, is low-key one of the best lines, like, funniest lines in this entire franchise. I would get that like, far. Good, I, just lo I just love the tonal change because, like, she's doing this real heart-to-heart -heart moment with him and just, like, she's being really serious and deep with him about saying like it doesn't matter what happened to you i'll still think you're more of a man than anybody and then his response because he's james bond is to say 
well that's because you know what i can do with my little finger it's just like i just love the way that he he can't he can't be serious with her even if he does like love her and care about her he can't bring himself to not be james bond in that environment i like it i think they're both you know clever lines and it was fun to see this bond give a line that i would definitely associate with either a more or brosnan uh she says though you know what you're not gonna let me in you've got your armor back on and he says no you've stripped that of me whatever i have left whatever's left of me is yours they're definitely in love And we get a whole thing here where Vesper curiously doesn't know about the whole thing with Mathis being a traitor. Uh, She asks, does everybody have a tell? And Bond says, yeah, everybody does. Well, except for you. Maybe that's why I love you so much. And he wants to quit MI6, spend the rest of his life with her. He says, you know, one of us is going to get uh, have to get an honest job, and it's probably going to be you, because I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> just like, yeah, it's true. But he's willing to just send his resignation, sail on a boat, and live happily ever after. Mm-hmm. And they do, and that's the end. What did you guys think of the film? But, <laughs> well, it's one of those interesting things as well, because it's like, because it's such a, because it's a reboot of the franchise, pretty much, to, to a degree. But people could kind of get the sense that maybe they're just bringing Bond back for a one-off and this is going to be the way you round it off. I know people probably would have thought, well, they're, they're just rebooting him. They're just, this is what Bond does. Bond comes back and then he'll do some more movies with Daniel Craig and we'll move on. But maybe just some people would have just, in the core of their mind, thought going into this. And maybe they're just bringing him back for this one movie and this is how they're just ending the character. Just going off in like was one of the highest notes possible by putting this really good movie together. But obviously we can't, but well, let's say Bond can't have nice things. He does go to Italy though. The series no, loves nice. going yeah. to Italy. And Vesper sees this guy who we don't get to know a damn thing about. This is one of my big flaws with the film. This guy is Adolf Gettler and he looks so much like Le Chief. He happens to have glasses with the left eye blocked out. You know, the, the eye that Le Chief had a scar on and would cry blood from. And I'm not the only one who thinks this either. So many people upon watching this film for the first time think that that's Le Chief having faked his death. I think it's horrible casting and costume design. They could have gone with somebody who looks anything different but they had to go with that particular actor, the glasses thing, the left eyeball. That's like having Jaws die. And then later in the film, a giant hulking brown haired white guy with suspenders and metal teeth shows up instead of, I don't know, fucking anything else. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I personally don't see the resemblance to the chief. So I just assumed that he was just another henchman that worked with, um, uh, Mr. White, and he, like that's all I really took from it. I just thought, okay, this is another guy that's going to be involved at this point. I I didn't read too much into any connection to the chief. I mean, I can see where you're going, and maybe it was just an oversight on both of our parts, but I also didn't see the connection. If you do a search, you'll find that lots of people are just like, wait, who's this guy? Is that like uh, the chief's brother or something? Like, it's a whole thing like that because it's the eyeball thing on top of things, but it's like. Similar build, similar face shape. Like it, nobody would have ever had, uh, you know, a thought about that if it would have been somebody who, yeah, super long hair and he's, uh, you know, a different ethnicity or something, or even just didn't have the eye thing. I think people wouldn't think about it, but I think it's really terrible casting when it comes to that and terrible costume design and all that stuff. So, major flaw. And we don't know a damn thing about him either, so that's not even like, you know, somebody introduces him or something where it might be a little bit different, but... Anyway, Bond points out that Vesper stopped wearing the necklace, and she says that it's it's been time, you know, time to get over somebody, essentially. And she leaves a message on her PDA. She goes and heads off to the bank. 
Oddly, she leaves the PDA behind, but, you know, I mean, it comes back later on. M calls up, asks if Bond is just ever going to deposit the winnings. So Bond calls up Mendel and he says, yeah, the, you know, the funds are being transferred right now, like right down the street. So clearly it's by Vesper. She's set Bond up. And he watches her hand the money over to Gettler. Cue the action sequence. Uh, there's a little bit where Gettler's like, you know, I'll kill her. And Bond just goes, allow me. Talk about a 180. I like, well, I I like it. I it's that. just like his heart has been broken. And right. He doesn't know. He doesn't know the full context of it. And he just like, like fucking hate this woman now. Because right. Because she's, she's taking him for up. a ride. Like, yeah. yeah. Taking him for a ride. So it's like, wow, man. Like, of course he's going to feel like that. And this um, is yeah, cool too. It's a uh, Bond electrocutes a guy. Uh, Gettler's yeah. killed with a nail gun in the eyeball. Very cool. Yeah, I like the sense of jeopardy in this because they're fighting in a in an old building, and because of the things that Bond does, where he shoots a couple of, um, I don't know what really they are. They're just like a couple of inflatables at the bottom, but they're like actually they have high pressured air or anything like that, and it just starts the building to collapse around them while Bond is fighting off all these henchmen. Yeah, it's like water tanks or something. I don't know how that works either, but that's when you go like, yeah, I don't know. They they fucking figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I like the good visual. I think the um the CGI in the building going is doesn't look that bad at all. Yeah, the building's collapsing. Vesper says she's sorry, and she allows herself to be trapped underwater. Bond tries to free her, but she's committed to her suicide, and it's terrible. With this beautiful rendition of her love theme. Again, do yourself a favor. Listen to the track called Death of Vesper. Just on its own. You don't gotta watch the movie back. Because it is so, so, so good. It's like a heart-wrenching theme. Because you know at this point it's played throughout the movie. This is Vesper's love theme. And since it harkens back to his previous love themes, it's the James Bond love theme. And it's in this context that we've never seen before. Cause we didn't even get this when it comes to Tracy. Cause that was just sort of, you know, Oh wow. Shocking. And then it's the end. And then da 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 kind of thing. Like they even give you this little tease that he's gotten her out and he's going to give her mouth to mouth and he's going to save her. Like what she did with him with the, you know, the, uh, the med kit, like, you know, you're watching the movie and you're thinking, Oh, she's going to, wake up out of this and go, are you okay? The reference back to the Bond theme. And the music teases this idea too. Again, if you listen to it, there's this like, like build up of like, oh, she's going to start breathing. And then it just goes whoosh. No, she's fucking dead. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. It a, yeah. It's a harrowing thing. Really. Of just seeing, it's just the way that it happens where Bond is down there and like she essentially kisses his hand and it's like says that and just allows herself to drown. But it's like she goes all the way to the back of the elevator and then she screams underwater and it's and reaches it's outward out. too. Like she's just having a second thought of like, wait a minute, oh my god, I'm gonna die. Yeah, it's, or it's either that or it's just that or she's just trying to speed up the process as much as possible. Either way, it's just it's it, yeah, it's heart wrenching because even though, as far as we know at this point, this woman has betrayed him, he's still desperately trying to save her, and yeah, she is. She's just allowing herself to die because she knows what she's done to him, and she can't live with herself doing it. But just just seeing anyone drown in any context or mm. any movie whatsoever is just because it's in many people's eyes, mine included, it's the worst way to die. It's like that uh, smoke inhalation, burning. Just something where Ugh. it's slow and you have to just wait for it to happen to you. Any kind of like suffocating type of environment. Oh, and you, God. Yeah, and you, just, and you just know that like there's nothing you can do about it. But you just have to wait and experience it. And I, I, I would love to know how they, they shot this thing. Because it looks, it, I mean, it looks so like yeah it just looks like someone drowning and so obviously i assume that they were just constantly giving both of them 
oxygen constantly throughout this thing but it's just it seems like uh it, it doesn't look like a scene that i would like to film hell no i mean i'd rather film that and the safety of all that than to jump on the crocodiles <laughs> that's true but yeah i don't i can't even open up my eyes underwater no i can't either i have to wait uh swimming goals yeah, i'm not a fan of water so uh this is just the worst for me and it's definitely the worst death for a Bond girl that we've ever seen. You know, Paris gets killed off screen. Tracy gets shot in the head, immediately dead. Yeah, it, It's traumatic. It, it's not at all what people were picturing in the theater. That's for sure. But, I mean, obviously, you had to end the movie like this or come close to ending the movie like this. Obviously, there's still a bit more that we have to talk about, but it's just... Because you can't have her survive. Cause, yeah. Because she's because she and Bond were in love, and that's different than basically other other Bond girl besides Tracy. So she had to die. Just, just the way, as you say, the way they film it makes you just get that little bit of hope that she's just going to wake up and survive, and then maybe she has to go to maybe the people could finally hope that maybe because of the way that she was a traitor to Bond, that she just ends up in prison. And so he just has to like separate herself from her that way. But no, they, they kill her and it's the right, it's the right thing to do. Even as harrowing as it obviously ends up being. It's a bold thing to do too, to kill off the main Bond girl. Oh yeah, absolutely. But it's, but considering like this is a reboot of the franchise. And so this is kind of like the making of James Bond. It's so like that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. It's a sign that hardens him in a different makes way. It... Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I'm sure. I'm sure a Pierce Brosnan's bomb would be hard in multiple ways at this point now. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, no, that's. Um, but yeah, that's that's something that's like in mold him, and obviously that conversation that he has with them kind of confirms it afterward. Yeah. While this is happening, Mister White is just watching on. He's got He's the got money. Double O Seven has utterly failed every objective possible he didn't get Lashif. vesper's dead they've got the money he completely fails in this movie mm. and it turns out that the algerian love knot was from vesper's boyfriend who was threatened and she was blackmailed to turn on mi6 and points out you know sometimes we're too busy looking at everybody else that so we don't tend to look at the people that are around us. You know, we're too busy with our enemies to look at our friends. And she says, well, at least this clears Mathis. And Bond says, nope. Her being guilty doesn't mean that he is innocent. It could be a double blind. So she says, well, I guess now you've learned your lesson, right? You don't trust anybody. Uh, You know, come back as soon as you can. I know you might need to take some time. And he's got a really brutal line. Why would I need more time? The job's done. The bitch is dead. Oh, it's so it's so so harsh, but it's so what this guy would be feeling at this moment in time. The the soul is being sucked out of this man, and I like it because eventually we get to a point where he's like at Dalton level and he just doesn't care about anything. So you can see where it all starts and I love that. Yeah, it's just it's just the moment where he goes the like like, as he talked about earlier, this is the moment that he let his armor down, and it completely bit him in the like bit him in the ass. He let his armor down for a little bit and got immediately stabbed in the back. And he's never gonna make that mistake again. And that's why we have that scene in the beach in Goldeneye where she's like, "How could you be so cold?" And he says, "That's what keeps me alive." Mm. It's like I'm never gonna do this again. It all f- fits in. Like it's almost like they're taking loads of different elements from all the different Bond movies and just f- realized, okay, if we're gonna do like a more of a an origin story. We need to take all of those elements in. I think they do a great job of giving giving that an origin with his relationship with Vesper. So then uh, M backtracks a little bit, spares him some of his humanity, says, isn't it obvious that you weren't killed after you were tortured because she made a deal for the money in your life as an exchange? She knew she'd be killed anyway, but she loved him. She was just in a shitty situation. 
So it's like that's just enough for Bond to not just be like nihilistic. Because it's like, okay, wow, she did care. This just sucks. Yeah. And she sees, uh, or he sees that she used left a thing on her phone to have James be able to contact Mr. White who pulls up to his lavish countryside villa, gets a phone call, asks, who is it? And bam, bullet to the leg. Crawls over to the guy who shot him. Who, you know, he's got to respond after he had said, who is this? He says, well, the name's Bond. James Bond. With a roaring James Bond theme for the first true proper time in the movie because, say it with me, now he's James Bond. <laughs> it's a good, this is a good now he's Bond. If it didn't pop up six other times in the movie, and then if it didn't get completely erased in the next movie, yeah, it's great. Because it just go. you know, I mean, we get Bond, James Bond, and then, da, 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 and you're like, ah, the Bond theme's so good. You know, like that kind of thing. And that's the movie. Uh, yeah, shit, right? The, the fucking masterpiece. <laughs> like, it's legitimately this and Goldeneye might be all you ever need to know the James Bond character. It's fucking great. So let's break down some of those elements again that we had mentioned before. Let's go with the music. Just a little, you know, we already talked about most of it, but I absolutely love the score. I give a thumbs up to You Know My Name, despite the fact that I do have it ranked low, but that's just because I love all the other ones, too. So it's not like it's like, oh, I don't like it. No, it's just I love a lot of these themes. Music-wise, totally a thumbs up. Absolutely. Yeah, my favorite theme of all time. And the music itself, like the score itself, beautiful. Action and humor, thumbs way up. Action is some of the best of the entire franchise so far. Just it feels very realistic, even though obviously it goes it goes to certain levels, especially with like the parkour and like the flipping cars and stuff like that. But for the most part, I think it's it's really well shot and the humor is more subtle than in previous Bond movies, but it's there and it's great. Yeah, action thumbs way up. Humor not as strong of a thumbs up as it would be in previous films, but still thumbs up. Let's go with our allies. We've got Money Penny. Nope. We've got Q. Nope. We've got Bill Tanner. Nope. But we do have M, who is awesome. Thumbs up on M. M is great. And I understand your point about, oh, no Money Penny, which was missing. But I think that this movie. For the allies it did have, the relationships were very strong, and I think there is something to be said there. I yeah. wasn't as opposed to Money Penny not being in this, but I think that Q should have. And actually, I'll think even more so, Villiers, it should have just been Tanner. Thumbs down hmm. on Villiers. Fair enough. Yeah, I think I, I think if it was, I think it was if it was Tanner, it would just be like Tanner just being a guy. As well, so it'd still be the same guy. I assume they would have cast, right? But maybe, yeah, Tony's got a point. Maybe having the name value is enough. I feel yours is in the book, if I'm correct. So it's not like they just made up a brand new character or something. But it's still just kind of like, eh, I don't know. He's not going to serve much of a purpose. Should have just brought in the Tanner character earlier, I think. But thumbs down on Villiers, thumbs up on M, thumbs way up on Mathis. Mm -hmm. He's great. Yeah, great character. Thumbs up on Felix. Yep, he was very good as well. He was obviously less featured, but he had he had a strong purpose in the movie. Even just showing up, it's like thumbs up on the character being back. Thumbs down on Carter. Yeah, he sucked. <laughs> <laughs> To put your fucking hand there. <laughs> yeah, fuck that guy. Let's go over to the gadgets. Thumbs down because we've got a uh, 
homing beacon implant, the bug, the med kit, thumbs down. Thumbs down, but maybe it's like Callum said, you know, technology had advanced where they didn't feel like they needed these gadgets. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this. I'm going to thumb down the gadget and I don't fucking care. Well said. Let's go over to the girls. We got Vesper, we got Solange, and we got Valenka. Who, she's more of a villain. Bond doesn't like flirt with her or anything like that, but some people classify any girl in the film is this kind of stuff so uh thumbs up man what the f- i mean thumbs solange is a thumbs up and she is nowhere near on the level of vesper vesper is no. arguably the best bond girl i would say so I who's think arguing the, who's who's good yeah, yeah <laughs> good I, like it's me it's one and two her and tracy i think she's a far more complete character than Tracy is. She gets more time devoted to her because, and that's just due to, I think, as much the modern era as it is due to just the strength of the character as well. But yeah, I, I feel like it was just only appropriate, at least on my perspective, to put the two women that Bond loved at one and two. And Vesper, Vesper's just an awesome character played by an awesome actress. Yeah, by the way, again, maybe it is just the modern movie the way the movies are told in the modern sense, but very good storytelling. Just, they did not skip out on any character development here. I love Vesper. I really like Solange for what she is. So again, we're going all thumbs up when it comes to that. Mm. Um, The villains, we got a lot. We got Carlos, the airplane bomb guy. We got Dryden and Fisher in the beginning. We got Gettler. Malaka, Valenka, Demetrios, Obano, Mr. White, the Chief. Technically speaking, all the other people like uh, Fukutu are probably all villains too, but they're not really villains like in the story. Uh, I mean, outside of like, like Carlos doesn't fucking matter, but like Le Chief, Mr. White, fucking awesome. I I like the fact that I'm, I know most of the henchmen don't get named throughout the movie. I just like that they were there, and it's more that I like what they did more than who they were. And that's why I appreciate that. So I think even though the villains don't stand out because most of them don't get named, it's it would still be a thumbs up to me. And then you just add on top the Sheaf, and the Sheaf is just, he's great, he's played by a great actor, and yeah, he's, he, he ranks very highly for me. Le Chief's logic and intelligence alone gives this movie a thumbs up for the villains. But as Callum said, I I like the way that everybody was played their role and played it well, even if they weren't like the most important character. And that I think rounds us out, right? We talked well, about yeah, villains, no, allies. Other than the actual movie, yeah. Movies. Uh, well, clearly like, this movie's a thumbs down. I mean, what, what do we need to say about this movie? <laughs> we got our rankings set up. So, of course, in the future, we're going to give you guys a more detailed breakdown of exactly what we have going on with this. But uh, not to um, beat the same drum, but yeah, this movie's awesome. So it's ranked. <laughs> Very, very highly for all of us. Uh, Callum has it the highest. He has it at number one. Rob and I have it at number two. Finally took um, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. I knew, I think down I knew it would, but I just had to watch it to be sure. First of all, hats off to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Had a great run at the top of Callum's list for nearly the entire journey. So kudos to that movie, but this movie is so fucking good. Now, I have it underneath Goldeneye. Rob has it underneath Goldeneye. I'm sure some people are going to say, what? That's insane. But, as you know. fucking cheeky as it is, it's probably for me because if, I, if you say bra, uh, Bond, I picture Brosnan. Yep. And <laughs> I still, despite the fact that this is a better movie overall than Goldeneye, I prefer watching Goldeneye more. So it's very close. I'll say that. Like, it's if anything was going to give Goldeneye its run for its money, it's uh, Casino Royale. 
even though License to Kill is my number three and everything like that, it's just like, okay, yeah, Casino Royale, I think pretty much everybody agrees, is fantastic. Look, Honestly, I, uh, I'm ahead. not Tony. I'm not going to say love that the gun barrel is too pointy, but I will draw the line at Brosnan looks more like Bond, and visually that pushes GoldenEye just a little bit further than this film because GoldenEye felt like more of the complete Bond film, even though this is objectively a better film. I think if you have a different looking James Bond, not that Daniel Craig's bad looking by any means, but I don't think that he looks the right part necessarily in the same kind of way you get. Let's just say you put another actor in there that fits that better. You give him one gadget, just one real gadget tweak a couple of lines add a money penny or a Q add and I think you're put, in. put Q in the scene where with the the blood thing and whatever he would get that kind of gadget hopefully add money penny but I, I would argue she doesn't even need to necessarily be there but she you know you could replace Villiers with money penny and you get a better gun barrel thing going on yeah best moon I mean it it, for me, it's it's the best one. I just think it's the best story. It's the best, most well told movie. Craig is my Bond. I know he doesn't he doesn't match the physical characteristics of some of the other ones, but to me, I don't think anyone's captured the just the the brutality of being James Bond in the way that Craig does, and I feel like that is the most real and the most um, like the the, the most uh, intense version of the character, just he just he just feels more like a real fleshed out character than the other ones, which feel more like like I don't know I don't know how to really describe it. It's just like they're more just hu- like fantasies almost. Like those Bond characters, fantasies. This like J- Daniel Craig's Bond feels like a a, a more fleshed out character to me especially from this movie. I think that it's a it's a perfect origin story for the character. I know it's come like after 20 other movies has already uh, built up this character over time, but it's just it's just a perfect way of describing you basically even I know obviously we don't talk about the idea of like uh code names and all that stuff. But if we are taking the approach of this is just all the same guy doing all these different things, I think this movie sets him up perfectly to take on any other movie in the circuit from now on like it establishes who he is and why he's who he is so yeah i love this movie and of course we just need to say one more thing shaken or stirred (laughs) it's so shaken i mean that you could almost shoot back the line of does it look like i give a damn right now like it's so the movie's so shaken yeah, it's shaken into whatever that uh, to into the Vespa because apparently that's the best drink ever. So yeah, absolutely. So yeah, if you agree or you disagree, tell us your thoughts in the comment section below. Of course, we uh, are very high on this film, and people have different opinions. Maybe somebody disagrees. I'm pretty sure that most people would agree about it though. But um. It is currently mathematically our number one just because of the fact that Callum's got GoldenEye beyond the number two spot. And uh, that pushes GoldenEye just a little bit underneath there where uh, Casino Royale mathematically works out as the number one and GoldenEye number two. We'll see how some other future ones rank because I'll be honest, there's another one that comes up that gives these movies a little bit of a run for its money. And not every and penny of that, it, but yeah, and two, yeah, that. two that definitely don't <laughs> two that'll give the, the bottom a little bit of a run for its money. Not quite, but yeah, we'll get there. And just to round things out here again, reminder, if you're leaving your comments and you enjoyed this, hit the like button, subscribe. If you haven't done that already, check out the Patreon. If you want to help out in some kind of way, pick up some merchandise on T public and red bubble, check out the stuff on smart at moment.com. If you're into pro wrestling and follow us all over the place, you can follow me at Tony mango. You can follow Callum at Wigmeister 14. Anything else you want to toss out there? 
Oh yeah, just check out, as mentioned, smartcamoment.com. The power rankings is my weekly contribution there. Uh, there's obviously in the YouTube or uh, podcast feeds, you can check out the retro series that I did with Rob. Uh, so 2001 Arresting Odyssey and the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast. And yeah, that's it for me. Yeah, and for me, you can follow me everywhere at Dude Felice. Check out everything I'm doing over at Fightful.com. I'm sure right now we're on the road to Money in the Bank. Uh, bands are coming back to wrestling events. That's always exciting. Uh, make sure you check out all the coverage of NXT TakeOver in your house. And whatever else we've got going on, the world of wrestling never stops. So continue supporting, and I thank you. And not only does the world of pro wrestling not stop, the Review to a Kill series is not going to stop because we still have a couple more movies left to talk about. So join us for the rest of this journey and keep checking out what's happening next Friday. I'm not sure exactly what one you're listening to right now, what's the next one's going to be coming out. As I mentioned before, we're recording this on the 26th of May. So this is coming out sometime in early July. I'm pretty sure we're at the very least towards the end of June, but we'll see when we see you. And we'll of course see you next time as well. Cause James Bond and the review to a kill podcast will return with quantum of solace.